Can't hear. Am I muted? There you go. Yes. Have I been muted this whole time? Yes, you have. I should, I should do this whole thing again? All right. Well, Probably so. Ah! So welcome uh, to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club uh, for the month of January. Our book um, uh, for the for the Ma Comics Masterpieces Club this month is Kingdom Come. It is, in fact, a comics masterpiece. Uh, we could not be more honored to have uh, its author, Mark Wade, who is here on the split screen with us. Hello, Mark. Hey. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. No, my pleasure. Absolutely. By the way, I got to say you're looking healthy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling healthy. I'm feeling good. good. Feeling strong. Feeling good. To, getting ready to take on comics again. You know, <laughs> just... Good. Yeah. All right. Then the, yeah. we need that. We need you in the in the in the fight. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I inter all right. So you were showering me with compliments and interrupted. So go on. Yeah. Yeah. No. You're you're a you're an amazing writer. In fact, you know, look, dude. I I have I have this much notes of wow. like things that you've done. And that's like, Jesus, like th th any other person's career would be half of this list. You, I, you, you have done so many things. I have been very, very blessed, man. I have been yeah. really lucky. It has been like 32 years nonstop. Never had to pick up the phone. And, and that's not, that's not a humble brag. That's a, I can't believe this. That's a, yeah. like, nobody gets a career like that. So, yeah. So I know I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier. I'm thrilled that you have that many notes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we're not going to talk about most of this stuff probably, no, but, probably. You know, but, uh, let, let's start with the first question, which is always the first question. Cause it's the best question of all. Why comics? Why comics? All the things you could do, you could be doing a lot of things. You are clearly a very talented, thoughtful writer. Um, and I've tried comics? I've tried other things, but you know what? I dig comics. I dig comics because I it's straight from me to you pretty much without a whole lot of people in the middle. I You're doing TV, you're doing film, whatever. There's always other voices in the room. There's You're always having to compromise and water stuff down. I like the immediacy of comics. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, what about the, the, the way that the audience interacts with them? It's... it's it's it works on two levels. I mean, on a fan level, I like that. I like the fact that the you know the the people who are working on I don't know Supernatural, they know there's fans out there and they see right. them at conventions and stuff, but they don't have the same sort of interaction with them that comics pros do. I think comics pros are closer to their audience than I think any other you know entertainer in any other medium is, and so I dig that. And then on a on a on another scale, you know the way. The, the, when I write comics, I'm a keenly aware of the way readers react and interact with the page. It's a, what I love about comics too. It's a very interactive uh, mode of reading. And it's, it's, it's something that is very singular. Like you can't, I can't read a comic. I can, I can watch a movie with you. I can watch a TV show with you, but I but comics, you control the pace at which you read and absorb the story and the, and the information. So Everybody knows the frustration of trying to read a comic with somebody because somebody's always finished first and is like <laughs> tapping the other person on the shoulder to turn the page. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I, re I remember uh, my son wanted when, like, when he was like a little kid, like four and five, wanted to, to read comics with me. And I, I tried and I just couldn't. It, no. you, you can't do it. It's not the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, uh, what's your earliest memory of, of comics? It's the Batman TV show. I was three years old and you know maybe like a little bit maybe four and uh, my dad saw the tv show and was coming on and he remembered batman when he was a kid and plunked me down in front of the tv and that was it man i was just sold and so he bought me my first batman comic in like march of of 66 and it's i never stopped i just just kept piling on still yeah. do yeah. What's the, the first comic that you remember buying with your own money? How about that? That's a really good question. That's a very good question. And I have no answer because it would have been f almost 50 years ago. So right, sure. great. Yeah, but, but you can remember. Uh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Lois Lane's parents are. Come on, I, I know. But I would, but one of the but one of the reasons I got so many comics is because yeah. I had generous grandparents and I had, you know, step parents and I had various people always like taking me to 7-Eleven for this or that or whatever. So right. there were all there was always somebody even if I had some pocket money. There was always somebody buying me comics. So it wasn't until 
you know, I got to be like nine, 10, 11 years old, probably before I was actually just having to shell out my own hard cash. Yeah. That's not true. Superboy 155. There you go. I re- suddenly <laughs> it came to me. Superboy, that's the first one I remember buying off the stands out of, with my own money. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and so does, does that particular story, uh, stick with you? Like, was it sweeter? A because little. Because your own money? It, it, when I read that comic, there are certain neurons that fire yeah. that don't fire with other comics of that era. So there's still some sort of, I don't, you know, I don't remember the specifics of the feeling I got when I first read that comic, sure, but sure, it's still, sure. it's still in my DNA somewhere. So yeah, there's something sweeter to the ones you buy on your own. Yeah. 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 You were now you were in a small town in the South. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was Hueytown, Alabama. Yeah. And then Birmingham area all around there. So it was distribution was crappy. Yeah. You know, we we got the 32 page DCs and that's all you got. Marvels. Right. I had to, I had to be out of town to get some marvels and, you know, giant size books or whatever that they, they were hard to come by. But that's why I was a DC kid growing up because I knew Marvel looking back, obviously the Marvel books were better at the time, the mid sixties, late sixties, but I didn't know I, the deep South, you didn't have distribution. Right. Yeah, and so uh, were, there, were there any local comic shops anywhere? <laughs> please, near you? please, are you you kids today in your comic shops? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, there was. I was not. I didn't see a comic shop until I was about seventeen years old. Wow. Uh, I had to move to Richmond, Virginia, to see a comic sh- shop. There was, you know, the closest you get is you get, you know, the 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 bookstores with the crappy, you know, yeah. you know, stuff in the back and the, you know nickel half price comics in the back or whatever but in terms of comic stores per se no no i remember i would page through that overstreet price guide man i'd see those ads in the back for all these amazing comic stores in the new york area and i'm in alabama and i'm just dreaming of the day that i could finally visit one of those stores and i finally did when i was 22 my first visit to new york and the the disappointment finding out that they're all about the size of my living room <laughs> was was really crushing. Yeah. yeah. No, I can see that. I can see that. I um I remember going into my first comic shop in in New York. I went to the Bat Cave, it was called. I remember uh, that. I know that one, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Underneath the the poster shop and uh uh yeah, no, it was kind of gross and skanky down there and you know, yeah. but it was it was totally like something you had never seen before. Uh, I was very everything here is comics. That's amazing. And and the thing I remember the most, the thing I remember the most was seeing a list. Uh, uh, you know, it was like it was like the the, the mimeograph list the DC sent out mm-hmm. uh, to the comic shops of here's what's coming this week, next week, next month, and seeing that and going. Oh my God! There's actually a schedule these come out on because I didn't I didn't understand that then. You know, I thought it was just. And here's where that ruined me. Here's that ruined me. I, I told the story before, but not to you. It's a good story. The death of Phoenix. Yeah. I remember the moment I read that comic specifically because of the way it hit me. Because two months earlier, about X Men one thirty four, one thirty five, somewhere in there. Sure enough, my store was putting up the solicitations, hanging them yeah. up there, as you could see. And then I remember reading the solicit for X-Men 138, and it's like, you know, after the Phoenix stuff, Scott and Gene leave the X-Men. And I remember being so mad. Right. I was so angry because that was that was what was planned. That was in the solicits. And I was so pissed off that, I, that it had been spoiled for me. So when I read X-Men 137, I kind of read it a little jaded. I was enjoying it, but then I got to the end and this is not right. This is, I was in the twilight zone all of a sudden. This is not how the story is supposed to end. I saw it in the solicitations. So, <laughs> so it's, it really hit me hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see that. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Um, it's, it's weird because, you know, solicitations, as I said, there's a magic about them that shows that, oh, no, wait, this is actually a thing. This is a business. This is an industry. Like, But it also, it really ruins comics yep. in, in, yeah. in weird ways. And no one, no one alive remembers what it is like to not know who's going to be in next month's showcase, you know, right. or, or, you know, who Brainiac is going to be fighting next or what, who, you know, who the Fantastic Four is going to be up against next month. Cause you didn't know one until you got there and you put down your 12 or 15 cents. Yeah. So yeah. I, I do miss that. I also, as an editor, 
I miss the fact that you have to schedule and plan out that far and you can't just sure. build up a drawer full of stories and just yank them out of the drawer when it's time to send them to the press. And here, here's, here's three stories, put this in the comic, yeah. you know, you've got to plan that stuff out way ahead of time. And so you're always as an editor and as a publisher, you're always fighting the solicit. You're always getting the cover done way before the story's done. And you've got to, then you're locked into a cover and then you're locked into solicit copy. And everybody now knows what's coming up in your book three months from now, because you put it in the solicits. It really, I understand the function of it. I understand the need of it, but man, if there was some magic way I could make it so only retailers saw that stuff and not fans, I would be very happy. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I often think the same thing, but there's really not a physical way to make that happen. No. You no. know, uh, the, the second one person gets it, you Poof, know, somebody, somebody's going to run to rich that, yep. that, you know, yep. It's, yep. it's guaranteed that, yep. that that'll happen. So, um, so let's let's talk about your your entry into. Actually, let me ask this question before I ask that question. Sure. Um, did you did you draw your own comics or write your own comics like as a kid? I never wanted to be a writer or an artist. Okay, I had no ambition whatsoever of that. I had, I mean, I may have done a little bit of tinkering here and there and written a little bit, but I was writing nonfiction stuff. I got good at reporting for college newspaper, or school newspaper, and stuff. Uh, and I had a facility for language, but I honestly didn't think that I could ever come up with that many ideas yeah. that you, I, and I really, so when I got into comics, all I wanted to do was be an editor. That was yeah. my goal. And yeah. that worked out for a couple of years. And then suddenly I'm in the deep end of the pool and I got to have something to do. And luckily because I made friends with Brian Augustine and other editors at DC comics, when I was there as an editor, they fed me a little bit of stuff and I've, you know, it's been a good ride ever since, but that was not the game. That was not the career plan. Yeah. So you, uh, you, you went to, you went to college. You said, did you, what were you studying? What was, what was your major? I was, I majored in journalism for the first semester until I realized that I could never be the reporter who stands in front of the widow with a microphone in your hand going, how did it feel? Mm. And so I swerved over into physics. And so that physics of all oh wait wow okay yeah all i right. was a science geek too so uh, i you know and of course I'll, i've forgotten a lot of that stuff i'm not ready to be quizzed about you know uh, about this stuff not that you would but uh but i was you know so i was bounced between english and those kind of majors and uh and minored in physics and never graduated i'm three credits short three three credits i could i <laughs> couldn't have I couldn't pass German. I couldn't yeah. pass German and that was it. And so wow. three credits. I've actually inquired to the university, Virginia Commonwealth University where Michael Ringo went also yeah. as well. Uh, and I've asked them uh, last year, I, I visited them and I said, is there some way, can we make something happen here? Because it would kind of be nice after, you know, all these years to finally get sure. a college degree. Although it sure. doesn't seem to have hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So, um, uh, uh, looking online, you know, and online is always murky. Uh, yeah. uh, it, 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 it says you started working at amazing heroes and, and writing it at uh, a comics buyer's guide in the eighties is, is what it says is in the eighties, which is maddeningly vague. Um, yes. do you remember selling your first piece? What, what yeah, it, I was? Do. it yeah. was for, it was to amazing heroes actually. Yeah. And it was, something on Superman and it was about, I don't know, red kryptonite or something like that. Okay. And suddenly I'm a, I'm a published author. It was awesome. And that was 84 maybe. Okay. Um, you don't and at that the issue number, do you remember yeah. the issue number? Uh, 39. I mean, okay. amazing here was 39. That sounds right yeah, to pretty, me. Pretty early. Okay. Yeah. A and, uh, and so I had the taste at that point. Um, yeah. and of course I was following all those magazines. I was yeah. absorbing everything. Uh, and I figured that was maybe the way in because yeah. at the same, at the same time, I was also working the conventions in Dallas a lot. And yeah. so you're, you know, you're the, if you're the guy volunteering to take Dave Sim to and from the airport at three in the morning, then you get to talk to Dave Sim for half an hour. Sure. sure. And that made connections that, you know, the, the fan stuff, calling up editors for information about upcoming stuff for amazing heroes. Those really forged the bonds and made the connections and made me known at DC. So when they were looking for another associate editor that I got the call. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, uh, what were the, was that first gig? Was it paid? Was it a paid, uh, yeah. Gig? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, not much, but yes. Yeah. 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 Neat. Neat. Okay. 
Yeah, because there's not like a lot of options for new writers to get paid in in writing comics journalism today. Right. Right. Exactly. All. Yeah. Right. Right. It, it it and it's funny because you would think that comics journalism is so much bigger today. Uh, <laughs> right? it, yeah, yeah, but it's like it's like everything else on the web, right? It's just watered down, and it's just yeah. it, it's it's instead of being in three places, it's in forty. And yeah. because everybody has a keyboard, everybody thinks they can write. So sure. you know, yeah. it's it, everybody's writing for free. Uh, I was very lucky that Fantagraphics paid maybe like you know half a cent a word or whatever it was, but still, yeah. it was something. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I, you know, what I remember amazing heroes just being a fertile ground of great writing for the most part, you know, yeah. I mean, there was a little bit of trash in there, but I, I, I wish we had a magazine like that today, honestly. I do too. I do you too. Know? I miss, I miss that magazine a lot. I miss yeah. that. The, it, it's not the same reading it on the web. It's not yeah. quite the same. Yeah. 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 Well, just, kids, you know, uh, kids today and their kids today and their web. I know let's, let's, <laughs> having someone curate an experience for you you know like here's a here's yeah. the comic that we like and here's we want to talk about the comics that we like that that's different than reading a bunch of articles about comics that people I, like you know i still i still pick up an alter ego i still pick up you know the tomorrow stuff i still pick up back issue even though and if you hand me an issue of back issue and it's about 1980s barbarian comics i'm going to be bored out of my mind but it still is better than finding it on the way so it's still a right. curated experience exactly so i'll i'll plow through that just because i bought it so i'm going to yeah. read it god damn it yeah 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 so in uh in 87 you became an editor at dc comics yep yep i'd had a i had a couple of short superman stories published because yeah. julie schwartz julie schwartz was like the king of comics fandom yeah um he came from science. He and he basically helped invent science fiction fandom, and so moved over to comics. And so he was always very kind to fans and very you know, always on the lookout for new talent in the fan pool. So I was very lucky to sell a couple of stories to him early on. But then John Byrne came along. Julie left. There wasn't a connection there. So I was kind of flitting around. And then I got the call in '87 from Dick Giordano to come into the offices. We're looking for an editor. We're looking for somebody to come aboard and came in, had a, a disastrous interview, uh, truly disastrous interview and was sure I would never, ever get called again. And, uh, luckily that I guess somebody else didn't take the job because I got the, I got the nod. <laughs> what, what was so disastrous from your point of view? You remember, you remember Piranha Press. Yes. Yeah, of course. DC's foray into yeah. creator owned stuff. This is yeah. setting the stage for others. So, yeah. well, um, and also to, to bookstore market and in the real world sensibility. Yeah. I mean, I think Mark Nebula was really kind of way ahead of his time. Yes. At that yeah, point, yeah. You know? So what happened was before Nebula, when they, this was just a vague idea in their heads, they right. started reaching out to certain people in the indie press like myself. I know Brian Augustine got his call because of this. I know R.A. Jones, I think, got a call on this. And all of us interviewed for this nebulous job that was going to be whatever turned into Piranha Press. But the thing they had to keep it very hush-hush. So where it all went horribly, horribly wrong was that I was dealing with Dick Giordano, who told me what the job was going to be. Uh, actually, it's not true. He, he, he also told me, he couldn't really tell me the details. Hmm. He just brought me in for the interview. And he was going to be there in the interview with Jeanette and Paul and, and, and me. And then Dick uh, called in sick that morning. So I went into this interview with Paul and Jeanette, having no idea what job I was interviewing for. <laughs> but Paul and Jeanette were convinced that I knew what it was. Huh. They thought I knew. And it was it was ghastly. It was the, the, the it's I the, the strongest memory I have is at some point, Jeanette looks at me very early on and says, what have you done in your career and in your life that shows that you have the wherewithal to run a company from the ground up? <laughs> and I just, I just sat there and I, it's like spinning clocks are passing by me and calendar pages. And I just like, time is frozen. Uh, and I finally just spit out. I sold band candy in high school, going for the laugh, <laughs> going for the joke. And Jeanette just nods and scribbles in her pad. And that was pretty much it. So wow. I, I really thought that was his end. So I stomped wow. down the hall. I was pissed. 
and I stomped down the hall to look for Dick Giordano who'd come in and I, I started rant. I mean, I shouldn't be ranting at him, but I'm just a fan at this point, but I'm so right. mad. I'm right. ranting and he has burst into laughter and he's crying. His tears are coming down his face with laughter and he apologized and everything was good. It's going to be fine. We're going to call you. It's going to be okay. And oh. sure enough, you know, I, a few weeks later, it wasn't for this job, but the associate job opened up and yeah. can you, can you come in? And so yeah. it all worked out, but that was, that was my first time in a room with Paul and it, set a stage for my relationship with Paul for the next 20 years that I had to work really hard to get past. <laughs> I think Paul thought, I think Paul thought I was an idiot for the first 25 years of, of my career. <laughs> I, I think he probably thought the same of me too. So <laughs> Paul, yeah, Paul tends to talk to most people like they're 10 years old. Yes. But, uh, I, in my, in particular, and I say that with affection, but yeah, I know. We, have, we have a good I, I, relationship I, now, but yeah, yeah. anyway, yeah. So, so tell me just a little bit, let's spend like 10 minutes, maybe just what was DC editorial like back in those days? That, that seems like a really fascinating time where the yeah. direct market was clearly the, the thing, but it was so new at that point. Right. But we, we were coming off of Watchmen and we were coming off of Dark Knight yeah. and it, the whole it's sense up there now. was that anything goes and, and Dick was this amazing ringmaster. I he I learned more about editorial and how to manage creatives from Dick than anybody. Because Dick's attitude was you hire the best people for the job and you get the hell out of the way. Yeah. And let them do what they do well and don't nitpick. Yeah. And that was the sort of the editorial ethos up there. And so it really was a sense of experimentation. It really was a time for experimentation. It was much easier to get a green light on a project because it looked like it could be cool. Right. rather than having to justify the dollars and cents. Yeah. And it was, it was, yeah, it was just a lot looser up there. And it was, it, you know, there was still structure that I had to learn, but by and large, it was a lot more freewheeling than I see today, which is, you know, good and bad. I mean, you also got a lot of crap out of that. You got a lot, you know, you, for every watch when you get sonic disruptors, right? You get uh Robotech defenders, but there's still that sense of, you know, Comics it has a new, there's a whole new energy to it that wasn't here in five years ago. Yeah. Be because suddenly all the kids who were write, reading comics in the 60s are now running movie studios and TV studios. Right? And that's as much the success of Dark Knight and Watchmen as anything, is that not just the audience was taking it seriously, but also like media types were taking it seriously and, and paying attention. So... That was that's the whole new breath of fresh air. I, I 1986, I would think, would be the I still say is one of the most important years in comics history. Yeah, no, I would I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, and and you know, I mean, to the extent that really it, I opened my store in 1989, so mm -hmm. it was kind of the comics that were coming out then was like, oh, now I've got to open a store. This is gonna yeah. happen, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, uh, you were there for, for two years at, yep. at DC. Um, and then you decided to freelance. What was the thing that made you want to go freelance? Um, I was fired. So <laughs> that's, that kind of did it. Um, in retro, in retrospect, okay. looking back, I was a, I was like, I was a relatively callow and outspoken young man and perhaps a little too much for my own, uh, my own good. So I was, I was gently let go. Uh, yeah. but it doesn't seem to have harmed me as a matter of fact, I, you know, I actually send Karen Berger a, a thank you card from time to time. Cause you know, I could, I could have been there for 10 years, been a 10 year man and been editing firestorm. And that would have been my big claim to fame. So it all seemed to have worked out. Yeah. Well, and it didn't seem to have hurt you at DC, especially, uh, oh. Three I, years again, later, I, you're, you're on, I, you start your run of Flash, which was, I mean, I, I have to say, I think it's the most definitive run of Flash. Thank you. In the entire history of the thank character, you. right? You know? Um, yeah. I made good friends when I was up there. I made friends with Dan yeah. Raspler. I made friends with Brian Augustine, who was my best friend up there. And so, you know, Brian was the guy who said, look, we know he's he was fired, but still, let's give him a little work here and there. And he took, he stuck his neck out for me. And yeah. that was, that was because not that anybody was saying don't hire Mark way, but you know what it's right. like when somebody sure. leaves a company that's, you know, they're kind of dead for a while. And Brian stuck his neck out for me and I've never forgotten that. And I, I've 
always said that, uh, you know, Brian gets to, to ride this rocket with me as long as he wants, you know, cause he's the, he, he's the guy who lit the fuse. Yeah. Excellent. That's, that's really sweet. Um, you better pick it up, man. Cause we're only to 1989. So, Oh yeah, no, I know, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just we're only out of half an hour, man. I mean, that's not even, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> You, you ask me, you ask me what time it is, and I'll tell you how to build a watch. So this could go long, but that's okay. No, I like you know. I just uh, you, like I said, you've had a big ass fucking career, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I do. I we we will talk about Kingdom Come specifically. We will. I just I sort of want to cover some of this stuff because it's really interesting. Let me actually let me jump way ahead. Sure. Uh, and and let's let's like jump to two thousand. Okay. And at two thousand and on, because you have a really interesting period here where you, you, you start guerrilla comics with, with Kurt mm -hmm. and, and a whole list of people who are all awesome, awesome creative people without and a lick it, of business sense between us. Yes. Yeah. And it doesn't work at all. Nope. And, and so what is, is that, is that, is that the market at the time or is it? Here's what happened. So we got hooked up with, a venture capitalist who yeah. was going to help kept promising to help, kept promising to help. And, uh, the publisher at the time, a friend of ours, dear friend of ours, um, was managing that being the middleman and, uh, money kept being poured in and money kept being poured in and we were paying good rates and we were setting up at conventions. And, uh, we, at some point the venture capitalist just vanished like smoke and the publisher was embarrassed and working on trying to make this hold together. So he didn't tell us for a while. Um, so he was putting his own money into Guerrilla Comics at this point. Now, the footnote is that this person was also my agent at the time. Mm. So he was making his money from me. So without knowing it, I was the secret benefactor of Guerrilla Comics and had no idea. Right. And at that point, we we got the new, he finally fessed up right as the solicitations were going to go in for the first couple of issues. And do we pull that trigger or not? And it was a long 24 hours of me and Kurt on the phone going back and forth and pros and cons. And we finally pulled the trigger. But yeah, without we had already spent our, our, our money. So there was no promotion money. You know, there was no advertising. There was nothing. We just kind of got out there and hope for the best. And, you know, we made a good showing of stuff but you know comics is full of publishers that did three great comics and then you know evaporated so we were yeah. one of those yeah 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 and so so does that is it it does that did that make you a better editor and a better create cuz cuz you know you you went on to 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 work at boom you're now working at humanoids i I just, I wonder how that experience informed your path going forward. It made me a better publisher. I mean, it made me yeah. more aware of the business end of it. Like I said, that, you know, we, we fell into a bad way because of the eight of us on that team, like Kurt was the only one who had half a lick of sense about the business of it. And nobody, none, none of the rest of us could make change for a dollar. And there we were, but I learned a lot out of that. And then sort of took that to the next step, which was cross gen actually before boom. Yeah. Um, the good ship cross gen. Hmm. Hmm. Um, slowly I turn and, but again, picked up more there about how to run the business. How to, what, what are the dollars and cents look like? How do you read a, a balance sheet? Uh, yeah. you know, and, and again, working with creatives in, in close quarters because across cross gen, the, the, the gig was, everybody was in the, in the building. All the, you had, yeah. they weren't working with freelancers. If you worked at cross gen as a writer and artist, you had to work there on the premises in, East Jesus, Florida. That's not fair. It was Clearwater, Florida, home right. of Scientology. Salute. Um, and uh, so being in the think tank, if you will, for a year or so there, working with a lot of great artists, like close, mm -hmm. that was, again, also very informative about, okay, this is how you get people to do their best work. This, you do this, you do this, you don't do this, you don't do this. So a lot of it was just learning people management skills as much as anything else. Yeah. And it, it worked for a little while, the cross gen thing, right? Like it, it actually, that first year or two, I felt like those books were building in success and it was really kind of genuine and real. It did. And there were some really good books, but the, the problem was that it was structured as a, as a pyramid scheme. I mean, right. that was basically the structure of cross gen is they just right. kept 
kept putting more money in and more money in and more money in and more money in. And oh my God, we're sh coming up short. So we better publish some more books to make up the shortfall. But in order to publish more books, you got to hire more people. It means you got to pay out more money. And it just collapsed under its own weight. Sure. But don't you think that uh, that modern comics production also functions under a very similar scheme? Uh, 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 both Marvel and DC? Just generally in terms of you know, there's there's 17 Batman books. I'm just saying broadly, you know. No, but no, chasing yeah, we're chasing the doll. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's nobody nobody gets a chance to sit back for six months and go, okay, we're gonna come up with a real solid plan going forward. Everything in comics is made up at the last second. Yeah. And so that's why you have, you know, another Batman book, because we know that'll make money. And yeah. and we don't have the time to curate and process and think about what to do that's going to be a bigger thing so it's why marvel keeps going back to the crossover well because it works it doesn't work great but it works better than anything else they can come up with at this point and they haven't had a chance to sit down my dream for marvel would be for david gabriel to have six months off to go think about a new playbook but he sure. never has he doesn't have a chance i mean he's, yeah. he's in think of it all the time yeah no and it's I, it feels like it's necessary i mean i yeah. uh uh and you know nothing against marvel in particular i mean it's both companies they're they're both on this track that isn't producing things that it, and so the way they make up for it is by narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the fan base and yep. um uh do you, uh, do you just out of curiosity are you still reading and collecting any I, marvel and dc comics at, at, I still at it DC is still picking up a few, still picking yeah. up super, Superman books and stuff, and and the occasional thing. And at Marvel, they send the PDFs to to right. the writers, so right. I, at least I get to dive through that stuff. And yeah. I'm in, and still I'm enjoying some of the stuff. I'm enjoying probably more right now than I have been for a while because Al Ewing's on fire, because sure. you know, the, the, the Jerry Duggan's on fire doing stuff, sure. and the the Brian Bendis. Uh, yeah. I like what Brian Bennis is doing in Superman. So there's stuff that I nice. think they've got they've got some momentum. But again, like you said, like you said, I just don't know. They're just kind of lurching to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's hard to see a plan at either company, which yeah. is the crazy it, thing because right. I, I genuinely, honestly, truly believe that with those characters at both companies, that mm -hmm. if they did a focused plan. Mm -hmm. They could sell a million copies of every goddamn comic book in a line. And I, I, but I, in there, I know. Probably, you know, and in there, but in their defense, and I will say this from the trenches and having yeah. been here for 30 years, yeah. it is, you're absolutely right. And that is absolutely the way it should go. But I cannot overstate the feeling of being in the trenches and mortars are going off around you 24 seven when you're in comics publishing. And yeah. there is, there's always stuff on fire every moment of every day. And it is virtually impossible yeah. to block out enough time and enough energy, enough brain space, right? To sit down, calm down, and really come up with a focused plan forward. We should be doing that. People should be doing that. I think people are doing their best. But I can, all I can say is, in their, in their defense... Man, until you're in the trenches, you just no idea how much energy it takes you to keep the machine moving. Sure. I I, I guess I would say, <laughs> you know, I own a comic book shop, and so I really yeah. understand. You right. also owned a comic book store. And so I, yes. I think you get that we get that that's how it works. And yeah, you know, I don't think, but I don't think, fan, I don't think fans, I don't think fans have enough. We're in the same trench, but we're the ones who are like literally in the trench, yes. you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, lines, you're yeah. not the generals who are like, oh my God, like we're losing, you know, 10,000 lives. Like we're the 10,000 lives that are getting lost. You yep. know, I've always, uh, I've always thought of the, of the, the comics retail in a way is a metaphor of being at war and, yeah. and what we need from publishers and creative people. But, you know, from publishers, the mechanical part uh, is we need bullets, right? Like we can't yep. take the ill if we don't have bullets, you know? Uh, yeah. And so, and again, like I said, none of this is, the, the, uh, we, we're both in agreement that this is the way things should, this is the way sure. things should work. Um, but yeah, just being in the trenches, it is at the, you know, at the end of a nine hour day when shit's still on fire and you have the choice between pulling the trigger on some experimental 
you know, Steve Gerber book or another Batman book, right. well, you know, you know, the Batman book is going to at least be, you know, they're feeding you ammo. They're just yeah. not feeding you the most effective ammo. They're just feeding right. you. You're getting it. You're getting your ammo in a volume as opposed yeah. to accuracy. Right. Yeah. Right. No, exactly. And so this is, uh, yeah, I, 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 my, the other metaphor that I love here is that, is that, you know, we've been firing shotguns uh, all these years and what we need is sniper rifles, yep, you know, exactly. Yeah, uh, that, that's where the business is. And it's pretty clear, especially with social media and the way things work. It's all targeted. Advertising is what actually works in the real world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not strange that these things really seem apparent to me I, I, I'm just some stupid guy who owns a comic book store, which means I've really <laughs> got to be a stupid guy, you know? Um, yeah. uh, and, and I can see how this stuff is supposed to work. And people who get paid a whole lot more uh, just don't seem to get it. It's I, really odd to me. I think, that, I, think they, I think they get it more than you think. I just think that, and again, it is their job and to their yeah. best interest in the long term to make con to make that time to carve out that time to carve out that energy absolutely i just think i think they i think they understand more than fans think they do i think that i don't know but i would guess that david gabriel goes to bed at night going i wish i didn't have to do another empire instead of something really cool but we got to pull that lever so yeah. Yeah, no I, I would believe that as well i actually i think that david is a is a relatively good influence on comics as, I as well things go uh yeah I don't know. I just get frustrated because I I I, I hear you 100. You're you know, you're you're, at, you're absolutely right. I just yeah. I'm I'm just saying it. It is a complicated machine, and you know that yeah. too. So. Yeah, it's just it's just so hard to look at that. Look at the those big crossovers. Look at a King in Black, which I'm sure is going to be a perfectly good story. But yeah. before you, it even comes out. Again, you know this when because you worked as a retailer for a little while. You've got to order two thirds of it up front with no information no, and not, it's not yeah. returnable. And you know, you've just got to just have faith in the machine, which yeah. is not a rational way to live a, a, a business life. Nope. Totally. And I mean, there's no other, uh, there's no other retail business in which the customer is expected to order stuff three months ahead of time. I don't go into yeah. Adidas to buy a pair of shoes and told I don't be in in three months. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so how do we how do we solve that? Do you think <sighs> returnability would help? I think. I I don't know what's your experience. What do you, what you, what's your feeling? If if DC and Marvel would go one hundred percent returnable tomorrow, yeah. How much would that impact your business? So it would impact the business in terms of uh, uh, as new things come out. I would actually put my heart behind well maybe not even my heart right like a muscle like right yeah. now literally i i think that neither of those two companies care about me at all so mm -hmm. i i don't even i lift my finger like this for them you know right. in oh, terms yeah. of putting any kind of marketing muscle i'd rather give all my marketing muscle to image and boom even dynamite like who are making their books fully returnable um uh a vault vault a little tiny publisher yeah. everything they're doing is fully returnable right now. I, yeah. This is the way that the business needs to go, I think. Um, and, and it means that, you know, for new launches that look even slightly commercial, I'm going to reach an order that's, you know, as, as much as I can afford realistically. I mean, it's not sure. going to be Batman numbers, you know, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to put a number out there that, that actually means something, you yeah. know? I'm totally uh, with you. This is why we're in humanoids. We're pushing toward returnability on all the periodical yeah. stuff we're going we're to be doing. But that's, again, inside baseball stuff, you know, and you know this too, but people are watching don't necessarily know this. Diamond also dictates a lot of that. Sure. I can't just, I can't just say, I can't be vault comics and just say, I'm going to be returnable. No, yeah. you have to work with Diamond. You have to get yeah. their sign off and permission. And it is not easy in a lot of cases because it's more work for them. And sure. especially right now when they've, they're understaffed and- sure under yeah. you know whatever so yeah. so it's it's i'm with you i and i'm yeah. i'm and i i believe in affidavit returns because i tend to believe the best in people yeah um i know that other publishers are a lot more skeptical about affidavit returns yeah. for, the, for those of you who aren't inside baseball it means that when brian orders 60 copies of a first issue that's returnable he doesn't literally have to return those comics he didn't sell he just signs an affidavit a legal affidavit that says i didn't i didn't sell those comics yeah. and i want credit for them and 
then they are allegedly destroyed or whatever you do with them. I don't know. Yeah. We, we give them away at that point. It, yeah, they're exactly, actually yeah. Johnny Appleseeds. They're, they're, they become right. a promotional write-off for the, for the publishers as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no. And I, and it's a win-win for everybody, you know, yep. it, 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 there's never a problem giving away comics, you know? No, no. <laughs> Which, yeah. Thank you, Joe Field. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing I really want to talk to you about before we talk about Kingdom Come sure. is I want to talk to you about Thrillbent and I want to talk to you about digital comics. And mm -hmm. you made a really huge bet. You sold your comic book collection yep. and, for digital comics and yep. and it didn't really work. And, didn't really work. No, don't yeah. don't push me put around. It's didn't it didn't really yeah, work. Well, I don't want to be um, a dick. Is the no, thing. no, no, no. I appreciate I, that. You know, I, I I'm not like hey, I told you so, but I mean, you know, no. I, I did tell I, you so. Look, but, uh, I think but, uh, right. but but like, so can we talk about this? Like, sure. Why didn't it work? And because if it I, should have worked, right? It like should, everything it should have worked. I the. I bet early on digital comics. I still believe that there's an untapped market for digital comics out there that we just haven't been able to get to yet. Uh, but it's so we we went big on Thrill Bent, sold my comic collection um, to to it's help finance. Serious comic book collection, by the way. This is yeah. not some no, every DC comic since 1956 and so forth. So it was a pretty sizable collection. Um, so there's that, but it. You know, John Rogers, the the producer, TV writer, in with me, who did Leverage and other TV stuff, he in there with me, uh, partnering up with me on this, and we thought we had it, but we were just too early with a lot of stuff. I think a lot of it was, and I know everybody says, "Oh, I was just ahead of my time." I think we really were a little bit ahead of our time on some of this stuff. We we sort of we tried to get in the Patreon business before Patreon was a thing. Uh, we started to try to sort of hint at, at getting in, in what ended up being a Kickstarter business model before Kickstarter was a thing, but it was still my part-time job. It was still John's part-time gig. And you're only going to get out of something like that, what you put into it. And That's so the, the re, I think the reason it didn't work is because frankly, I just wasn't there 24 seven. I didn't okay. make it my focused passion project and okay. I couldn't, I couldn't afford to. And I think had I done that. I think we, I don't, we wouldn't have set the world on fire, but I think we would have been a viable concern. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the question I want to ask you, and I'm not, again, this is not me really pushing back in no, any way. Oh, no, no, and no. These are, these is a philosophical question. Absolutely. I, I think that one of the things that fundamentally makes comics what they are mm -hmm. is the gutter, right? It's right. not, it, it's not, um, it's not just the juxtaposition of panels, right? Right. Right. It's, it's the gutter in that space that lets the audience step in and sort of make the decision as it were. Mm -hmm. if, if I go to an example and everyone's going to be bored by this is it's the peanuts cartoon with Lucy and the football and you see Charlie Brown running and you see Lucy pull the ball. You see the ball being pulled, but you don't, you right. the audience are the one who pulls the ball away. Right. Exactly. That's, yes. That's what comics is. It's, it's yeah. that, that's what comics are. And it seems to me that that is extraordinarily difficult to make work digitally. It is hard. To, it, it was really hard to make work digitally, but I think we did it. I think we, I think we cracked a lot of the technology and a lot of the, 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 the way a digital comic should work. Cause I've always, always said it's a different experience. Yeah. Uh, comicsology is not digital comics. It's pictures of comic books is what it is. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not, if you're going to be in the medium, use the medium for what it works for and take advantage of the medium. And so with the thrill bent stuff we did, and this is where it always gets impossible to talk about because this is explaining an elephant to a blind man, right? If I'm trying to tell you how thrill bent works verbally without showing you, it's much harder, but thrillbent.com fans still there, go look it up. A lot of free stuff. Um, you can see where we, use the medium in different ways, invented different storytelling techniques. It was still comics, but it wasn't motion comics. It wasn't limited animation. It wasn't, it was its own thing. And I think it was a lot of hard work and it didn't quite pay off, which is a shame. I still yeah. think there's a market for it out there somewhere. And I think that in the multiverse, there's a much smarter Mark Wade who went all in. Okay. And, and so made um, it work. Uh, the state of Thrillbent today, I mean, it, as you just said, it still exists. Those books are there. 
Yeah. Uh, it's just lang it's languishing because again, we just don't have the time. Yeah. Um, but John no, and I both aren't buying in. It's not, it, it's because you can still do it, right? Like you can still yeah. buy comics there. Yeah. Yeah. Actually it was all, it's all free at this point. I mean, oh, a is it? Of, yeah, a lot of it was free at the, at the time. And that was, yeah. that was a big part of our model too, which was the freemium model of, yeah. you know, we're going to give you a little bit and then we're going to ask you to pay what you want to pay. Right. And in theory, I think that model works, but we couldn't get it to work. Yeah. Uh, so we never really were well monetized. Uh, we had we had clicks like you wouldn't believe, but we weren't terribly mon we weren't terribly monetized. Um, but so that stuff is still there, and it's still something that John and I want to go back and tinker with at some point when he finishes King Killer Chronicles and I finish, you know, running six different comic companies or whatever I'm going to do next. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so, so you you think that the problem can be cracked? either with money or time or yeah yeah i do i don't okay. it's i can't tell you why other than i'm a generally optimistic person but i'm also a puzzle solving person and i really genuinely believe that that somebody and it i hoped it would be me and i don't think it's going to be me now but somebody's going to come along and make it work i mean it's yeah it's look at you know paul levitt's actually to his credit made the analogy once he said it's it takes one lucille ball Sure. Because what, what Lucille Ball did was she took radio, which was, you know, which was what television was until Lucille Ball came along. For the first few years of television, it was just radio with pictures. Yeah. Nothing was happening. You didn't have to watch. And Lucille Ball took that and melded it with vaudeville. You get things happening on the screen and suddenly you've got television. Yeah. She and she and Merton, Milton Berle invented them invented the medium in that sense and so we're looking for that lucio ball you know we're looking for the person who's going to see the the connection that we haven't seen yet and make it work but yeah but I, but okay so but my counter argument would be and again I, you know you i don't need you to defend everything uh, no no, no. no uh, i'm uh, enjoying the conversation this is good how digital comics work you know i'm having next month's book is understanding comics so i'm talking to scott mcleod yeah. uh scott mcleod 35 years ago probably said infinite canvas this is an amazing yeah. thing and there was there's been a couple of neat infinite canvas comics and then that's it it never it's never worked in in 25 or 30 years and i i wonder why that is genuinely because it can't merely be money and effort lots no. of people put a lot of money and a lot of effort into it yeah yeah I well, I mean to be fair, when, oh, so to, to be fair, to, that it's something intrinsic to 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 comics on on a maybe you know maybe because maybe because some people are on a phone and some people are on a tablet, right? Like those are different experiences right. fundamentally, you know. Um, I think too that it's it, it, I mean we can't also we cannot understate how well it works overseas. I mean it, we're in and, and even web even webtoons over here is making some pretty good money off of American readers doing their, their infinite canvas, but it's the, it's the vertical scroll rather than the horizontal scroll. And my issue with that as a creative is that I don't think they use that format well, but they certainly use it well enough to make a lot of dough. So yeah. they, it's, there's truth in everything. Like there's, there's a little piece of it that's there and there's a little piece of it that's over here. Everybody has something right. Like nobody's done it completely wrong. Yeah, everybody's done something right, and it just takes the 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 you know Philo T. Farnsworth to come along and put it all together. Yeah, I just feel like it's been a really, really, really long time, and it has. he has put it together yet, which makes me think it can't be put together because you know the thing that I hear constantly, and obviously my bias is going to show here, but as a person owning a print comic book store, people come in and go, "Oh yeah, I've come in to buy this. I saw it online. I want to buy the real version." Yeah. You know, I can totally like, get that. Yes, the sense that what's online isn't real somehow. Yeah, I, it's and it's not in the sense that you know, uh, out of sight, out of mind, right? If your comic book collection is on a hard drive, you know, it's not the same as having it on your shelf and you look at it and you see things you want to, you know, you remember that you books that you pick up on over and over again. It's, I still think it's, I think, I think we, I, I was well, sure we would be much further along than we than we are today. Uh, I still think that given the dearth of comic stores in, you know, Montana, wherever, Mississippi, yeah. you know, that there's, that there's room for a digital comic experience that's more oh, than comicsology. Sure. But yeah, yeah. I, 
you know, yeah, no, but, I, I wasn't trying to suggest that I wasn't trying to suggest that digital comics should not exist or anything. Oh, like no, 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 I didn't. But I'm saying that I still think that I still think there is an untapped market there. Yeah. I think there is. And I think, you know, and I respect your opinion on this. And I, you may well be right. This may be Seward's folly. Yeah. But God damn it. I'm as a puzzle guy who is always looking for the answer to 37 down. Yeah. I really want to be yeah. convinced this is going to work somehow. Well, then that could be me. Yeah, I mean, particularly when I look at when I look at the big two and I look at Marvel and DC, because theoretically, theoretically, yeah. they're best positioned mm -hmm. to take advantage of this from the nature of the soap opera, right? Right. And, and right. the universal buy-in, which is a thing that I think you recognize the power of, right? The power of the DC Mar and Marvel universe. Yeah. It's superheroes. I don't think anybody actually likes superheroes, honestly. I yeah, think they like, like the soap opera and the Marvel universes. And that's yeah. different than superheroes per se. Yeah. You know, um, it's why no superhero line has ever worked. It, it, no. it just, it, cause there's no buy-in from the audience, right? No, there's no way again. And why, why do you want to be RC Cola? Yeah. If you're, you know, I, Pepsi and Coke exist. Why you're not going to topple Pepsi and Coke because of the best at doing superhero comics that there are. Yeah. So if you want to be RC Cola, you can run a superhero comic book company for about two years and then vanish. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about this book. That's the reason sure. that we actually are here. Happy to. You, it, it seems to me that, I, and I, you know, I'm just sort of looking at this from a kind of 10 years or 30 years in, in, 20, in 25. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but you know, you, you, you came onto flash in 92 mm -hmm. and kingdom comes 96. So you're still on, you're still doing flash, but flash was building. Like, yep. I guess what I'm asking is this is, this is a big book. This is not merely. This is not just some comic book, right? Right. right. And you, okay. So, whoop, 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 whoop. you yeah. did you realize that when you when it was coming together with you and Alex? Were, did you guys know what it was you had? I suppose is the first question. I didn't. I didn't know until the first issue she hit. I didn't know until the first issue came out, and suddenly I realized what we had, and it was terrible timing because I was just about to start the script of the fourth one. Right. And I froze like you wouldn't believe. I just drowning in flop sweat all of a sudden. Oh my God. And so the fourth one took me like three times as long to write as the first three. But it's, we didn't, uh, you know, we knew there was something special going on here, but we didn't know it was going to be that huge. We, you know, we had Marvels as a, you know, as a precedent. So it wasn't a complete stunning surprise. Um, but it, I am no one could have predicted we would be having this conversation 27 years later now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, or whatever it was. Uh, yeah. Um, how did you, how did the book get put pitched? It was Alex. I mean, this is, I cannot ever talk about this book without saying, look, look, all props to Alex, you know, to some degree, I was just the guy grabbing onto the train as it was whipping past the station. But Alex came in with uh, a bunch of drawings bunch of character sketches uh, and some rough notes, some ideas for maybe a scene here or maybe a thing here, but it, it didn't have cohesiveness and that by his own admission, it, it, it didn't have cohesiveness. It didn't have a story and he was looking for someone to help him craft that into, you know, a narrative and Archie Goodwin tapped me because if you're going to do this kind of book going, going in the places where Alex wants to go, you need the guy who knows everything about DC comics ever. Yeah. And so they sent him a few issues of flash to take a look at, to show I wasn't a complete fraud. And then they brought me on board and we sat there at, uh, at, uh, an Irish restaurant at, uh, over lunch for the Dan Raspler, Archie Goodwin, Alex and I, and we sat there and Alex talked about the story and I wasn't sure I was the right guy. And I wasn't sure it was the right guy. And I wasn't sure it was the right guy. And all of a sudden it just sort of, as we were talking, we started, he and I started connecting on what the characters meant and what the character, who, who the characters were on a fundamental level. And at that point I went, okay, we got something here. So we went away from that. And then I flew to Chicago, I guess, you know, a little while later and Alex spent, and Alex, and I spent like a long weekend just banging out a, a framework 
And from then on, it was just straight up collaboration, just back and forth. Back in the days of fax machines, we just shoot stuff back and forth every day. Yeah. Was it, um, was it, was it officially a book yet? Was there maybe not the contract signed, but at least everybody was like, this is going to happen or. Yeah. yeah, it was because it, because again, Marvel's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. Marvel's was a year previous. And so they were going to just follow that basic paradigm. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And, um, what was it, what, what was it like working with Archie? I, I, he's, you know, he, he's, he, he looms, I think kind of high in the editorial, um, yeah. lineage. And, you know, all at this point, all we have is secondhand stories, I guess. Uh, I mean, we, I can't interview him ever, uh, which is a horrifying thing. Um, that- Archie was a surgeon. Archie was a surgeon. Archie would look at, he would never meddle because it would do no first do no harm. But then he would see the one thing in your story or the one thing on that page that didn't quite work and very gently suggest maybe this instead. Yeah. And it would all, and it was just his, his, his bomb sites were dead on and his, his batting average was a thousand. Um, so he was involved in the early days, but after, but pretty soon, because it was a self-running machine at that point, it was given over to Dan Rassler who, yeah. who and, and then Peter Tomasi, I think was working under him at the time. So the two of them were, were wrestling this beast of the ground as yeah. Alex turned in his 10 pages a month, like clockwork. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so how, how do you, um, how do you work on a project like that as a writer when you're only getting the 10 pages? Cause you're just, you're, you're, you're getting it after the fact I'm assuming. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm doing foot. Yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing outlines. Alex and I are giving comments on outlines. I'm doing yeah. full scripts. Alex and I are, you know, going okay. back and forth in the scripts. It's full scripts. Okay, so it's okay. just, yeah, it's just full script. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't imagine working on, on an Alex book. That's not, you know, that's not yeah, script yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. Just, just making sure that I, yeah. I, which, which way you're doing it. Um, uh, it, it, you're, you're, uh well said, Brian. Yes, I know. Thanks. Um, <laughs> What uh, so so? What's what are your scripts like? Are they are they you know kind of Alan Moore level? Here's everything detailed out, or is it just kind of boom 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 closer to Marvel style or somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. I mean, I, it a, a a script is a letter to your artist. That's what a script yeah. is. It is yeah. it is just basically a, a and I am I my scripts are always very open. Uh, Howard Chaikin gave me the greatest compliment. Once when he said I was the most artist friendly writer he'd ever worked with, which was the, just the sweetest thing to say. Um, and George Perez said something along those lines too at one point because when he worked with me, because I I think visually, uh, I know when to give the artist plenty of room, and I also always bear in mind that it's my script only until such time as I turn it over to the artist to draw. At which point it's our story, yeah. right? And so you, if you're staring at this, I, I it took me a week to write this, but you're going to take you a month to draw it. And you're going to be staring at every page for eight hours. So I value your opinion tremendously. Yeah. As a, so it's it, the scripts are fairly open. Uh, I call for the things I really want specific in in terms of a shot, but by and large, it's just you know letting giving the artist as much room as I can. So, um, uh, in terms of writing full script, uh, like the, the the way that a page is structured, obviously is is kind of critical in terms of how a story is unfolded and mm-hmm. and like where the page turns are and things like that. Yep. How much of that are you thinking about and how much of that are you sort of directing the artist to uh, as opposed to letting them make those decisions? It's yep. really sort of it's really sort of instinctual at this point. It really yep. is like I kind of just without realizing it I I generally will put, you know, one one big panel on every page that's the big money shot and yeah. then you know, you know, know how, how much fits on a page and, and, and so forth. And so it's at this point, I mean, I've done this 2000 times. I mean, literally 2000 times. Sure. Sure. So at this point it's, it just, it's second nature. I wish I could, I wish I could give you a better answer, but that's all I got. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, kingdom come you're, it, 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 it's an Alex project. It's, it's happening because of that. Yep. It, it's bigger than a, the way you would normally be writing a script at that time though. Right. Because each issue is 48 pages and yep. I like the fourth one was a little longer, wasn't it? No, they're all four. They're all 40, okay. I guess 46 with, with 
ad right. with a, a title page. So, so yeah, they were, but it was daunting. I mean, again, that's, you're working on a much bigger canvas at that point. Yeah. And you can't, you know, it's much easier to ask Greg LaRoque on flash to go make a correction on page three, because you thought of something on page 20 mm. than it is to call up Alex and go that, that panel that you spent a day painting. Um, can you, can you maybe repaint that? You don't want to do that. So it's got to yeah. be a lot more, a lot more structured and a lot more uh, locked down. So, and in fact, that is my one disappointment with the book looking back at it is that it is so structured in, into what I knew had to be there that there is, there's not as much spontaneity and life in some of the scenes as I would personally think hmm. I, I would, I would, I see in some of my other work of that time. Um, it's, there wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for me to say, okay, well, I've got two pages here in front of me and I don't really know what to do with these two pages. So let's just go have fun and do this and see what comes up. And that's kind of the fun of writing, but it, it wasn't the case with kingdom come, but it, again, it's not a, not a criticism. It seemed to have worked out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very much. It worked out. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, this came at a moment in comics where I, I think that we both felt that comics were going it kind of in the wrong direction in terms of yeah us, angst and darkness and horror and death and yeah broken backs and and chains and yeah and Alex, and, yeah. And, and, and Alex exactly and Alex <laughs> and I just hate that crap it's just yeah. we uh, but you know I we it. We weren't, it's, I'm careful when I say that because I don't want to sound like Abe Simpson, you know, yeah. yelling at the clouds, but it, it, it just, it wasn't that we were wedded to 1960s comics. It wasn't that, it wasn't a nostalgia trip for us. It was just more that at DC in particular, we think of Alex and I think of those characters as very noble and very elemental and, and very mythical. And it, they formed our mores. They formed our ethics and our morals, uh, Alex and I, and, and a bunch of other people. And so we, we felt that that had been lost a little bit was getting lost, not necessarily with those characters, but in with comic book characters, comic book superheroes in general. Sure. Well, but, but I mean, even Superman, uh, uh died and was, there were four of them and one of them was a murderer. And, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, it wasn't, uh, kills me sometimes that that period of comics uh, i mean i'm glad we finally got past it and i and i think in a way it's a book like this that you know I, it may be overselling it but that helped us get past it you know to, to show us the nobility of the heroes again and and th th that power in 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 that in that faith and that belief in these characters that they do the right thing that they stand for something meaningful there's just something i don't i'm not a cynical person by nature I am not a Pollyanna, but I'm not a, I'm not a cynical nature and I am not, and I have no use for cynicism. I think it's cheap and it's easy. And so everything from flash on, you know, is for me, when I write it, it's always been about the, the, the positive stuff, the, 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 you know, the rising above the giving hope, the, that's, it doesn't mean that there's not a room for other comics that aren't optimistic and there can be plenty. I love a lot of really dark cynical comics too, but that's not what I do well. Right. And so that's, you know, from flash on, that's been my marching orders, my self-imposed marching orders. And if it, if it helped at all, and I think you're overselling it, but I think if it, if what I have done has helped keep us away from the edge of the darkness a little bit, then I can live with that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, it, look, to be completely cynical at the fact that this book was a success, a commercial success, mm -hmm. at the time that that those dark characters were starting to wane in sales success, right? At least that much helped uh, get people back to maybe the idea of of these characters being noble again. You know, I, I worry sometimes because, I, particularly at DC right now. I think, wow, there's looks like they're really forgetting who these characters are once again. You know, it's all really like it, you know, uh, Death Metal's a great comic, but it's all 
dark versions of Batman fighting other dark versions of Batman, right. which, which in a way is like the laziest, lowest fruit in the world, right? <laughs> you know, like, oh, what if they're bad, right? Like any hack can do that. Not that anybody's working on them is, are hacks, but you understand the thing that I'm trying I to say. I understand what you're trying to say, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's, it is true that DC does, I mean, one of the things that I think worked and made it a book that you're holding on to 20 some years later is that Alex and I both have a very strong vision of each of these characters from Wonder Woman to act. He's the only, the only person in the, in the world I can have an argument about Martian Manhunter with for 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and we, any D you throw at any DC character that Alex and I grew up reading and we can do 20 minutes on them. Mm. And we are pretty much in sync about that, about who they are. And so that that was the lifeblood of that book. That was what that was that to me was what what I wanted to put in the book is like this is who the my I'm I'm not making these characters cool. They're cool characters. Yeah. It's just that I have to sometimes scrub the soot off a little bit and just shine up the diamond and show you why I really think it's a diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, very much so. Uh yeah. very much so. Um what was uh who whose thought was it to make um uh, the Green Lantern uh, and and Flash, their JSA versions. Or... That was that was Alex. That was, that was Alex. yeah. Alex. It, pretty much the answer to most of those questions yeah. is is Alex because he yeah. had the character sketches and he had the he knew what he wanted to draw and right. I'm yeah, I'm down with that. And so and and was this a challenge for you to figure out the backstory or to to some degree? together you know yeah to some degree i mean it, it was it was certainly a challenge to go okay well i've got these characters that are really awesome looking and should be a part of the story somehow but i don't know how mm -hmm. and find a way to fit them in but you know but alex again was so great to work with i mean when alex came to the table i remember it was wonder woman really wasn't much in the story and, yeah. and in his vision and captain marvel wasn't really much in the story they were just sort of you know background players if you yeah. will or, or b level guys and so he was very generous about me coming in and just going look this 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 pump this up i feel strongly about this so it was again it it was a very collaborative storytelling process there's no getting around that and i i cannot help but always put an you know whenever somebody compliments me on the book i just want to put the asterisk in that says oh and alex don't forget alex you know yeah yeah no i wasn't not that you were. No, no, no. I'm yeah, just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, it looks like we have a question, I'm told. And by the way, if you're watching at home and you want to ask a question, ask a question in the chat. We're we're screening them. We'll we'll ask them out. There's a Facebook Live thing where there's questions, blah, 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 blah. So uh, put it up on screen for me, Jordan. It's Seth. Hi, Seth. Um, I am so glad that Brian brought this up. Mark, do you think the superheroes as a comic genre have lost their relevance because DC and Marvel have refused to grow and change them. I think they have lost their relevance because they grow and change. Hmm. I think it's the, the exact opposite of that. It's not true for you know your B-level characters, your Iron Mans and your Hulks or whatever, but the core characters, the Spider-Mans, the you know, Supermans, Batmans, um, we, we tend to stray away from what makes them unique. And there's still something, no matter what, there's still something relevant about an immigrant from another yeah. planet. You know, there's still something, there's still something relevant about uh, a, a guy whose parents were shot and he wants to put the world back together because of this. You know, there's still, there's still relevance in all of those kids, still relevance in a, in a uh, kid who gets a big head and superpowers and ignores responsibility. And then he has to pay a price. Yeah. Um, I see, I see what is being said here. I think I, and I honor the question and I think that, yeah, w some characters do need to kind of adapt a little bit more of the times. I think what's interesting right now is what Tynan's doing with Batman and the idea that we're sort of defunding Bruce Wayne, uh, because right now he is, you could look at that character, the way he's been built up over the last few years into gi a giant tank. Batman is basically just a mechanical tank with a guy in the in the in the heart of it, yeah. and that very easily maps to a very heavy heavy militarized police force. 
Um, it's easy to make that. It's, it's not easy for you and me. We're white guys, you know, to make that, but it's much easier for other people to see that connection, whether or not it exists or not, it's, it's still there for some people. So Tynan is, is playing with that. And that, that is a good example of not really changing the character. In fact, sort of rolling it back to what it was, but in that it makes it more relevant in the process. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I can see that. Um, uh, you also said you were enjoying the Bendis run, so I'm assuming yeah. that you're that you're good with Superman, uh, and you know being being not being Clark Kent or still being Clark Kent, but that not being a secret anymore. I don't have to love everything Brian did. Okay, no, I was. <laughs> I know. I, I'm 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 being I'm being I'm 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 being I'm being tactful. I that is that is not my favorite thing Brian did. Let's put it that way. All right. I think that he really lose something with that character. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, yeah. but, but, but if you're going to talk about relevance, but I get it, Yeah, I get it. We're living in an era more than ever before where it's important for people to be able to be who they are. Sure. And not hide. It is more important than ever for kids to know that that is okay. Sure. And so I get why it, that is somehow at odds with a guy who has a secret identity 24 seven and lives among you, but doesn't tell you who he is. I, I get the disconnect there. That said, I still think you lose something important in the, in the bigger scheme with Superman when you take that away. But, you know, but I, th I think that was Brian's attempt at relevance with Superman and, and it seems to have connected with some people and yeah. I get, I get where he came from. Yeah. He, he, well, we never had, we never had this conversation, but this is what I'm presuming, but this is, you know, this is what yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I think I agree with you in terms of the the roots of the characters and and them be, their, their central metaphors being essential to what they are. Yeah. I, I think my I like what he's doing with Jonathan Kent in Superman, but I I don't think that John can really ever be Superman. All he can be is Superman Junior. Do you yep. know what I mean? Because yeah. Superman has to be a strange visitor from an alien planet, or else he's no longer Superman. Exactly. That's uh, exactly right. The same way that Batman has to be traumatized in that way, it, it can't just be. Otherwise, he's just you know uh, lurk on a gargoyle guy. Yeah, you know? it, it's it, this. Uh, this is why I'm so I'm so protective of these characters' legacies as per personally as a fan and as a creator. It's not because I again, it's not because it's a nostalgia trip. It's not because I want comics to be like they were when Mommy was still alive. It's that, um, it, it, it's that with these characters who've been around longer than you and I've been alive, like there's reasons that these characters work and we don't necessarily know what you can take away and not take away. And the whole thing falls down if, cause we don't know what the X factor is that makes wonder woman work where six other wonder woman pretenders in 1942 didn't work. Yeah. You know, we don't know why Batman worked necessarily and six other Batman clones didn't work back then. You it's, you can look back and go, what do you mean? Because you don't know. I mean, it's not what the artwork. The artwork in Batman's comics was horrible. It yeah. was, there's, I think it's arrogant to think that you know what that X factor is. Then, and so I'm, my, I'm constantly preaching, look, try not to do any harm. Like, try not to break the fundamentals because you don't know for sure which of those is the Jenga block that you're going to take out that's going to make the whole thing fall over. Yeah. Okay. So this brings me to question from of all people from Paul Levitz. Okay. I, I actually wrote Paul and because I said, you know, I'm doing a show on Kingdom Come. Is there anything maybe I should ask him? And he's like, no, nothing about the book. But, uh, uh, and, and I lo I don't have the question on my phone. I thought I had sent it to myself, but I, so I'm going to do this from memory. And his question was essentially, um, you have been one of the strongest adherents and proponents of continuity and traditional, not, I mean, I mean, not traditionalism, but, understanding what the character is and not taking away that X factor. And yet at the same time, you were a very strong proponent of the notion of hypertime, where all of the stories can happen and they're all true, um, uh, which might be simplifying it a little bit, but overall, um, how do you philosophically uh, uh, juxtap justify those two kind of inherently uh, 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 against each other positions? because you can have earth one and Earth two. <laughs> because, okay. All right, because, okay. I mean, that's really kind of it because you can have right. your sealed bag of continuity over here. That is, here's the Superman mythos and it's continuity, but then you can have then this other Superman continuity that, and I, I, again, I, cause the, cause the, the horse is 
been out of the barn since 1986. Right. Like there, there's no putting that toothpaste back in the tube, man. There is going to be, there's going to be continuity broken everywhere. So you either fight the machine and try desperately to make all the threads hold together when there's no way you can do that because no one 80 years ago thought we would be telling these stories 80 years later, or you can just kind of surrender and go, okay, well, let's make the mess of it. Let's just say that parallel universes exist. Hyper time is the, is the multiverse. Let's say the multiverse exists. That way all stories happen somewhere there's your continuity. I can, that's, that's me making peace with, with that notion. I mean, can you can remember there have been more stories told about Batman than about any other character in human history. Yeah. No one expected, no one that Bob Kane didn't think about this in 1939. It's just that something that's going to last a few years and then go away. So continuity is I, I'm with, you know, I was, I would, I was hanging on a continuity and was as a big a continuity cop as anybody in the world, but they reached a point where it's just like, I just, I can't keep pushing the broom back with a tide. I can't keep yeah. pushing the tide back with a broom rather. And I can't, uh, so hyper time, yeah. go hyper time. So, okay. So, uh, I'll just, let me keep pushing at this just a little bit. Sure. I've got a question line, but I'm going to keep pushing this one just a little bit. Um, because as a retailer, one of the things that I see is that the consumer wants continuity. They want mm -hmm. a clear understanding of what stories count. Now, Part of this is, I think, uh, how Marvel and DC are essentially overproducing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 25 Batman books. Let's say people want to know which two they have to mm -hmm. follow. Um, uh, and and so, um, doesn't continuity matter more than ever as a result of that? There's a you, that is a point worth making. I will say that as a retailer. You know, when people would come in the store and say, I want to start on Batman, where do I start? You know, everybody would just kind of fall down at a dead faint because all you can do is hand them a book from 30 years ago sure, and say, okay, start here. But I can't hand you anything from the last 10 years because right. there are, there are six Batman volume ones yeah. on the stand. There's, they did you, there's which Batman number one am I supposed to start with? It becomes a, a crazy question. I think that, uh, yes, it, it would be wonderful if, but I, but again, I think that, I think it's broken. I think that that's, I, I don't know that you can repair that China vase at this point. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, it, you know, I, I, to an extent, I, I wish that we would look at the ultimate line that Marvel did uh as a way to do that you know uh those those books were really good and they stood alone and they brought people in and they i don't know i i, I just think i just think that those characters you could really you could really do something with them if uh if the publishers took there's just the yeah but there's but then you've got to you know you've got to keep everybody else away from those characters for you know, six or seven years, you've got to be very curated right. and protective of those characters. And that's just really hard to do in the, in the business now, because if, because if I'm doing a Batman, if let's say, let's say I'm doing a Batman book and I'm doing the Batman book. Yeah. Like, like, like you want, like yeah. I want as a retailer. Yeah. And then Frank Miller knocks on the door and says, I want to do a Batman story. Sure. Well, no one, no one's going to tell Frank, you can't do a Batman story. Sure. So you, there's no way to be as protective and, you know, create a, a fortress around these characters. So you can have that, you know, that, that strong continuity that you could back in, back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I would, again, I would hope that the care that the publishers would, would protect their characters, not protect. That's the wrong word, but mm -hmm. anyway, well, we have another question. Don't we, uh, Jordan, <laughs> you wanted to ask? No, cause I could go down a rabbit hole, but let's not, let's not I go don't. down a rabbit hole. Cause there's no point no. in that. Uh, Jason Kelly, in one interview, Mark commented on the significance to him of the scene with Clark's glasses in Kingdom Come, but some of the audio went out in the interview. What does that scene mean to you? Not this interview, but a previous one. Yeah. That was the moment that I knew I got Kingdom Come. We're sitting at that table, we're having the conversation, and Alex and I are talking about how it might end and some things, and I had this mental image of Superman at the very end of the story you know, just for the first time in the entire story, just putting his glasses back on and becoming human again at the end of the story. And once I had that image, that was it. That was now I got the story. Now I totally understand. And I own 
two pages of Kingdom Come. And those are the two pages, the, the very end. I don't have the splashy pages with people in costumes. I didn't need those. But Alex was kind enough to give me the pages of Superman putting his glasses back on. Yeah. That's, 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 that's how it works for me a lot of times. It's just a, a, a flash of an image, something, something striking that I don't have, I, you know, I don't want to force it in, but it'll get, it'll give me something to me when I, when I write comics, a lot of times it's like, um, it's like those, it's like those, it's like putting all the cards face down on the table. And you're like pulling up one and you look at, you have an idea for one idea and then you pull up another one and here's another separate idea and you pull up enough and you start to put them together. Yeah. Suddenly this idea might connect to this idea, might connect to this idea. And before I know it, I've got a script, but that's kind of how it happens. So, so again, a very long answer to a very short question, but that's the, that's the answer to the Clark Kent question. Yeah, no, that's a great answer to that that question. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, about the epilogue. The, there's sort of eight pages that weren't in 8, 10, whatever it is. There's a number of pages that weren't in the original comics yeah. uh, that came later. Wh where did this come from? How did that come that about? Was, I, that I don't was, that, what happened. No, that, that was sheer avarice. That was, that was in, remember, we were still in the fledgling days of trade paperbacks at that point. Yeah. Uh, and DC said, okay, we want to do a, a nice hardcover with Bob Chapman. We'll do a graffiti hardcover. But we want something else in there to really sort of, you know, make it special. And so we had the, the, you know, the remit was we want eight pages or whatever it was. Well, what do we do? And it was the perfect tinker to ever to chance triple play because, and it was Alex. I, I came up with the idea of the three of those characters a, a year later or whatever, the Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman having their conversation. Uh, Alex came up with, Kingdom Con having play taking place in the kingdom in the Planet Krypton restaurant. And then Dan Rastler came up with the idea of okay, they're having a conversation, but this is what they're talking about. They're talking about Superman and Wonder Woman, you know, yeah. expecting a child. And so that was and that was all in one phone conversation. It was like boom, boom, boom. And it's so much fun to as much as I rail and scream against comics that are six pages of people sitting around having a conversation, if Alex is going to paint it. And it's going to be in a really visually interesting place like the Planet Krypton restaurant. I think you can get away with it. And that was so much fun to write because I'm writing the characters. I'm not writing them. I'm not having to think about what gigantic thing I can have Superman punch that he hasn't punched before or what clever way Batman has to solve this mystery. It's just I get to write the characters pure. And boy, it was just I, I wrote that thing like it was just like water coming out. It was just like just flowed. Yeah, yeah, and it and it's it's such a beautiful ending to the book. I, I I wonder what was it hard to write something? I mean, well, you just said it was easy, but yeah. but to write something that that didn't undercut the ending of the book, if you know what I mean. I, I it was, and I don't, I cannot remember how we managed to negotiate that because that was twenty years ago. But it, it, it we knew we had to be protective of of the note we ended on with a book. So, and I, but I get, I get what you're saying. You know, you don't want to come along and do something that's going to undercut what you've just spent 180 pages trying to sell. Yeah. 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 And yet it works really fantastically. So, yeah. so kudos to you too. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, uh, I got, it's, it's such a good book. God damn Thank it. you. Thank no, you. It's a, just, it just, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it makes me feel hopeful about, about superheroes and about that, you know, and, and what these characters represent to us and, mm -hmm. You know, uh, let me ask you this question: of the of the younger characters, of the second generation characters, were there any of them that you felt a particular affection towards? Thinking, not not especially. Mm -hmm. uh, there is n nostalgia factors in my love of comics to the degree that um, I am passionate about the characters that I grew up reading. And there is a point at which a newer character, no matter how great they are, is never going to appeal to me in that same exact primal level. You know, everybody, I still think of Chemical King and Timberwolf as the new Legionnaires. Um, <laughs> you know, I still think of I, I know, I, Elongated Man's red costume as his new costume oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, Fi or Firestorm as the new Justice Leaguer. Sure. So, so it's no, no comment on any of those second generation characters but it just they none of them spoke to me yeah and and yet you made wally west like 
the, the character. That's that's. Yeah. Oh, you! I thought you meant. I thought you meant, I thought you meant in terms of. Okay, I thought you meant in terms of specifically Kingdom Come, but you meant no, no more. No, than I did. I did. I did in that okay. case. But but it's interesting that that's your point of view when when you know you made Wally West the Flash right. in, in a way for you know even for guys like me who 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 Barry Allen was our Flash, our Flash, know? absolutely yes. But, but no, then Wally became the Flash, and that was great. That was even better. It be, and it's great, you know, because because the Flash doesn't have a central metaphor that that that. Right. It have doesn't to have to be Barry Allen, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, because it was already Jay, and you know, like it, right. it, it's, as long as the guy runs fast, he yep. could be the Flash. You know, yep. yeah. And that's why that worked. I mean, that's yeah. so. I, I had so I big props to Wally. You know, as a as a character. I mean, I never really cared about him much growing up, but when I got the opportunity, when I saw what Bill Loeb's did with a book before me, yeah. Bill got me really invested in Wally. Yeah. As a kid, made me convinced that Wally was a, an interesting character. And then when it was handed to me because of Brian, you know, I, I just put everything I love about the Flash into that thing. Yeah. 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 What's, what's your favorite thing about the Flash? <sighs> the generational aspect. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the franchise, it's the general, the, the fact like it is literally a baton that you hand off to the next runner is a beautiful, such a beautiful metaphor for what that the Flash identity is. Yeah. Um, and also just the speed. If I could pick any super, if I could pick any superpower, it would be super speed because you can just get stuff done. Everybody, yeah, time is the enemy of all living things, Brian. You know, I just, I want more time. Yeah, no, I can see that. I can see that. Um, I don't know. What else do I want to ask you about Kingdom Come? I don't know. I don't just, I want to rave about it. I just love this book. <laughs> I, I Don't let me stop you. Yeah, I, I just, no, I like, I like hope and I like, I like the future and I like, I don't know. I like Superman. I'm, What's great about Superman? Talk to us about Superman. Why, why, why is Superman so good? Put in, put another, put another roll of film in the camera. He's going to talk. Um, there is something that is so fundamentally identifiable about that character. And it has to do with Clark. It has to do with what we were talking about that, that, Yes, nobody knows what it's like to leap over a tall building in a single bound, but everybody, everybody knows what it's like to have that moment where you feel like if they just saw me for who I really was, you know, if the cheerleader really just saw me behind these glasses, who was behind these geeky glasses, or if the, you know, if the, if the cute guy, you know, could really see who I really was inside, they would, they would adore me. They would really, they would really appreciate. Everybody knows that feeling, so everybody understands the, the metaphor on a primal level yeah. of of Superman taking, of Clark taking those glasses and being the person you know disgu disguised as Clark Kent, but really the super the Superman inside us. That's that's what he represents, the super the super person inside us. That's a big part of it. Um, I also think that there is there is a sense of joy to that character that is very unique to other comic book characters. There's nothing really joyous about Batman unless you're Adam West and there's nothing particularly joyous about Spider-Man. There are moments, but at core, not necessarily, but with Superman, you know, I mean, think about what makes him unique. Think about the thing that, that really makes him immediately stand out. If you ask people, Tell me something about Superman. Random people, tell me something about Superman. And I've done this to, to test the theory. To a one, they almost every one of them will say the same thing. He can fly. Yeah. He can fly. And that is such a universal, primal, you know, we dream of this. We, we long to fly. We love the freedom of it. And Superman, with that big smile and that that soaring through the air, that that invulnerability that invincibility that sense of freedom and being able to just be i think really resonates with people whether they realize it or not yeah yeah and 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 i just i i love that he's there for us and it's not you know i yeah. i Anytime yeah. I see a dark Superman story i'm just like no nah, no nah. nah, he's now nah, he's he's there for exactly he's he's hope i mean he's really he's yeah. That that's it's it's corny, but it's we it's needed, you know. It's especially needed in times, you know. It's it's desperate. It is needed. People really want to believe that there is a guardian angel looking over your shoulder, whether they're 
want to admit it or not, everybody has that feeling that they wish that there had, you know, somebody was looking out for them in that level, in that sense. So that we all get, you know, we also, you know, we also, some of us, I, I think I speak maybe more for myself than general populace, but certainly speak to a lot of comic book readers when I say this, that there is a sense of loneliness to yeah. Superman at core that, that he has to be apart from the world. He has to hide behind Clark Kent because other, he cannot live a regular life in this world. He can't just, he can't play pickup basketball. He'll fall and break your arm He'll or whatever, you know, he'll, he yeah. can't, he can't move through the world like you and I can. Um, and that sets him apart. And I think that that speaks to a lot of us too, that the, the sense of that loneliness, the sense of, I want to be part of something bigger. I want to, I long to be part of something bigger, but I, I can't because of this or this or this. So I don't know your thoughts. Did I, am I just pulling that out of my, out of my, no, out no, of that, I mean, that all sounds exactly right to me. I, uh, I, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, about a week ago this time, give or take, you you were really dark on Facebook. And I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. like, if we were done the interview then, I would have been, like, trying to shore you up with Superman. Yeah, you know? I, yeah, I know. It was yeah. hard. That was a tough day. It was, it was a tough day to, to see how many people yeah. voted, voted for lying and yeah. voted for corruption and voted for such darkness that yeah. I really wanted the blue wave redemption. I think I, we really, I, as a, I really wanted us to prove that we weren't that, yeah. that we weren't bullies at heart and 70 million of us disagreed. And that broke my heart. It just, and it still breaks my heart, but I, I feel better every day now that I see what's, what's happening. And certainly, you know, I, I have energy for what, I don't think that there's a magic, I don't think anybody can come along. I don't think God himself could be in that job and throw a magic wand and make everything work at this point. But I think we were better off than we were. Yeah. And I just, I hate bullies and I just don't like having a bully in the White House. Yeah. Yeah. Very much agreed. Very much agreed. Uh, but we have hope. And, you know, yeah. and, and like I said, that guy with the S on the chest is, that's, that's a great, it's a great symbol. It's a great thing to believe in. Yeah. It, it, it really is. He, it, that character matters. They people, and, and that is why, and this is not even necessarily true of Batman as much as Superman, but there's no place in the, I've traveled all over the world. There's no place in the world you can go and spend a day out in the, among the public and not see somebody with a Superman t-shirt or a Superman hat or Superman something. That symbol mean whether they realize it, that mean, that means something to them. It means yeah. that, it, it means that because the other thing that people know about Superman is that he does the right thing. He does his, I've said it, but his greatest superpower is not super strength or flying or, you know, speed, bouncing, speeding bullets. It's, it's that with all of the choices available to him, with all of the things he could, he could have anything, he could take anything, he could do anything. And instead he spends all of that energy selflessly. Yeah. And all of it, yeah, we're never working in his own self interest, working for our self interest, and that that sense that you know, right makes might is again, it's very primal. It's it's very child childlike, not childish, but childlike. Um, yeah. But it still it still resonates. People want to believe that that there's some merit in doing good. People want to believe that there is, that there's a reason that, and I think fundamentally people are good. I would not have said this last Tuesday, but I think fundamentally people are good. And I think that seeing Superman or knowing what Superman's about, it connects with them on that level in a way that it doesn't with Iron Man or Green Lantern. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, well, I could just ask you like about comic book characters and I feel like we could get, <laughs> Let's do, yeah, do 20 minutes on, uh, on wonder girl. Okay. That's, uh, yeah. yeah. No, that actually might be hard. 20 minutes on wonder girl. Who is wonder girl? It might be hard to do, Come but yes. On. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, listen to the question I'm told. Okay. Let's, let's see what we got. 
It's from Jordan, who's our cameraman. Uh, <laughs> Jordan, uh, I sometimes have a tough time relating to the core DC characters because they're all essentially gods. Mm -hmm. As a writer, is it a challenge to humanize them? Nope. Nope. I mean, I get why they come off as gods sometimes, but that's in the hands of a bad writer. They are mythical. They should be mythic. They should be bigger than Marvel characters, but it's what makes Superman human in the right hands with, you know, when the right people are writing him is the challenge of having all of this, what we just said, the challenge of having all of this power and doing something selfless with it. And the challenge that that, and, and what does it mean to do good in the 21st century? That's yeah. a very vague thing to say. What does that mean? What does that, in, in, in such a very complicated world, what does that mean? Um, those challenges, they make those characters human to me. And again, I, I always write from the inside out. So I, I, I never feel like Superman's hard to write, Batman's hard to write, Wonder Woman's hard to write. It's just, that's just me. But I get why sometimes in the hands of people who don't necessarily love them to the degree that you and I do, and they can just come off as big, giant, you know, invulnerable, unhurtable things. But you know, they're yeah, they're they're bigger than Spider Man and and Iron Man in terms of their godly sort of statue. But I, I think that's what makes them unique. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Jordan, do you have a follow up to that? Uh, no, just, no. He's I think, I think the follow up came with, with his action. His previous answer I just his, was for his, me like okay I needed to all right question very, very very good yeah. very okay good. very good love it love it uh do we have another one or or is hey hey on limos i'm gonna i'm sorry i butchered that i'm i'm really sorry uh and thank you for for joining us uh greetings from papa Jan. i don't even know where that is south america maybe well, uh, Mark, what makes you include the decisions of humans nuking metahumans? I think there's a scene in the first Avengers movie that ripped that idea off. <laughs> I don't know about that. It's that's a pretty easy idea, but it's it, it was the climax that we were inevitably building to in Kingdom Come. That it was humans versus superhumans when it shouldn't be that. When it when it, they you know Superman knows more than anything. It's it's important to have the synthesis and be of both worlds, which is why Captain Marvel was the key character. But uh, it just, from a plot point of view, it just made sense. You're going to get to the point where people are going to be so afraid of superhumans that they're going to have no choice but to start dropping bombs because yeah. people are that way. Yeah, yeah. Do you, um, I mean, you still freelance for Marvel in DC. Yeah. Uh, is it is it is it harder to do that now? Is it easier? I I, I, I wonder, you know, because you've, You've clearly gone past the point of your fanboyness, right? Like, right. I mean, obviously, you are still a fanboy about some right, but I've but I've gotten the, the yeah, early cool. fanboy jollies out of my yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to write Flash. Right, I've gotten that out of my system by now. Yeah, it's all, it's all done now, and and so uh, it becomes a mechanical challenge almost, or is that wrong? It's not a quite a mechanic. The challenge is always finding a way into the character that I haven't seen or finding a way to see part of my, finding some part of myself in that character that I can relate to. Um, what is it about that character? What is it about that character that appeals to me? And, and a lot of times it's just really a deep dive. Dr. Strange was an aberration. Like I, I had no interest in writing Dr. Strange, but Nick Lowe put it in front of me and made the challenge there. And I started thinking about Dr. Strange and I went back to the earliest days of the Ditko Lee stuff. And got a sense of who that character was and built it in my head and just sat there and just wrote like six or seven pages of just free association. Here's what I, th here's what Stephen Strange is, who, here's who he is as a person. Here's what motivates him. Here's what he thinks. And at the end of that, when I get that out, of, when I get that down on paper, then suddenly I've got a bunch of stories in front of me that I can do. Mm. And that's so, but it is difficult in the sense that I, there's not many of them left. Like Tom Brevoort and I joke about this every couple of years. Like, okay, you've done with Dr. Strange. What now you've yeah. done every, you've done everything you've written them all. Right. So I don't know. I, I, I hope I live to have this problem for a long time to come, but I, I have, I, I've told my flash stories. Yes. Right. I've, you know, I've told my wonder woman story, 
you know, it's, I don't know that I've got more of those in them. So yeah. I have so, to choose here. So, so let me ask you just as a, as a long time veteran yeah. of comics, you've, you've written a lot of things that don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. And while you've benefited from them, certainly as yeah. you were writing them, you got, you got well taken care of at the time, right. presumably, um, at the end of the day, you don't control those works, you control those stories, or right. even control if they're in prints, or right. in what manner they might be in prints. Um, does this make it, like knowing what you know now, do you look back at any part of your career and think, yeah, I wish I had put more time into my own career owned, or I wish I had put more time into this or that? Yeah, I I, I wish I would have. I, I don't, not to the point where I wake up regretting it every day because, there we get back to why I'm in we get back to why I got into comics to begin with because I love the characters yeah because I so I love those characters and I want to be able to give back to them in a way that they gave to me when I was you know eight years old right being able to be able to give to part of that mythos and and help preserve that that mythos and so if if there were no superheroes I wouldn't be writing comics I just and uh, I it is, it is much more difficult for me to do creator own stuff because, and I've done some, not, not a huge amount of my share, but, uh, but it's harder because you got a world build and I don't like world building. Mm. I don't enjoy world building. I don't enjoy, I like the fact that you hand me a bat cave and a Batmobile and I got toys to play with, you know, um, the coming up with empire or coming up with Potter's field or coming up with the irredeemable or whatever. These are, this is stuff that I have to world build. And that is, a much different animal and is not is not as easy for me as writing the stuff that I loved, you know, the characters that I love. Yeah. Interesting. So so I'm I'm willing so I give myself that leeway. I also and this is true, um yes, I don't see a nickel off of, you know, some a lot of things that I've done for DC and Marvel because that's the deal. I mean you know that deal going in. You know, you know that's, deal, exactly. You know, deal going in. Um, but I will tell you that I don't get a I don't get a nickel off of the Speed Force, for instance. Whenever they use the Speed Force in movies or TV or whatever, but I'm not regretful over that because that's the deal. And I, and more importantly, if you handed me a check for ten thousand dollars for that, it would not compare to me for the moment I'm watching Flash on TV. And they use the word speed force for the first time on my television. Right. I lit up like a, like Broadway <laughs> and that feeling, I will forget where I spent the $10,000, right. but that feeling will be with me forever sitting yeah. in, you know, sitting in, you know, Superman Man, in the man of steel movie. And, and as many problems as I had with it, you know, having him say the S stands for hope. I mean, that's just, yeah. that's awesome. I was able to give something back and yeah. there's no, there's no financial consideration for that. Yeah. But yeah. I'm but, okay with that because that feeling that that is more that that means something, you know. Yeah. No, and I and I get that, and I feel that, and I and I love that. But I also I also wonder, are, are you not? You're not being taken advantage of because you knew what the deal was, right? Right. But yeah. But shit, you should get a ten thousand dollar check. I mean, you should just you just should because because yeah. you added this thing that wouldn't exist and they're making a pile of money off of it and you're not making any money off of it anymore. I, and, and, you know, so, uh, it, it, when you talk to young creators, mm -hmm. right? Like what is you, what, what would you suggest to a young writer coming up now? Should they be working at Marvel in DC? Should they be giving them their ideas, uh, uh, and adding to that mythos that we all love? Or, or should they save their best stuff? You know, sort of like the image guys said, you know, 25 years ago and actually kind of got extra credit, you know, for it. Um, uh, that why would we give them our best ideas? Why should we not do, do them ourselves? I, I get that. But here's the thing. I mean, it's first, well, you can, yes, that's true. But all of those guys also learn how to do what they were doing by doing Marvel and DC comics. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that, even if you just use them as training wheels, even if, you know, as a young, if a young creator, if you get some DC or Marvel work, go with it because 
yes, you're not doing your own thing. And yes, you're not um, necessarily reaping the same benefits as you would if you were doing your own creator own comic. But you know what you are getting? You're getting editorial guidance. You're getting an understanding of what it's like to collaborate. You're getting, you're getting, you know, if you're working with a good editor, you're getting, you know, knowledge of how a story works. You're getting, you're, you're being taught in a way that if I'm just going over to image and doing my own comic and I'm over my own corner, it's all mine, but I'm not really learning anything, right. you know? Right. So, right. I mean, you know, if I could, yes, if I could, you know, send Mark away to a time capsule 20 years in the past, I would say, yes, do more creator own stuff. Yeah. But I, I've, I made my peace, you know, with it. I say that now, talk to me in five years from now when I'm, when I can't get hired and nobody will hire me, but yeah. right now I feel okay. Do you think broadly, like very broadly, do yeah. you think that, uh, that the editorial levels at Marvel and DC are what they should be? Because one of my concerns about comics generally is it appears to me that we've lost most of the institutional knowledge mm -hmm. uh, of what makes good comics. And instead, most editors, this is the job that they're hired to do, but they're more about making sure the trains run on time than yeah. actually trying to get the best story coming out. And it's not just that they're about making the trains run on time, it's that they were taught by people who were taught only to make the trains run on time. And they were taught by people who were taught only to make the trains run on time. In other words, we've lost the, there is a generational knowledge that right now exists in like Tom Brevoort's brain and a few others, but not a whole lot of basic story structure, basic craft, basic stuff, you know, the, in, like you said, institutional knowledge um, that has not been passed down. And again, that is not a knock on those editors. I mean, first off, you can't be faulted for not knowing something you weren't taught. And secondly, every editor I know has like five times the workload that Julie Schwartz had. Every editor I know has six times the workload that, you know, Archie Goodwin had. They just, they, the, the, the gigantic amount of fires you got to put out every day, sometimes getting the, that the best you can do is get the trains out, out on time. And I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And I would think that, uh, that at a lot of publishers, humanoids might be in this, this bank as well, that, you know, the people are producing for graphic novels. So you're, you're talking about pulling together 200 pages at a time. Yeah. Uh, uh and not merely 20 pages that you're trying to get out the door every month. Right. Like that, right. that puts its own set of challenges on there. Uh, yep. No, you're right. I, I, I do think that, I think, I think a little more highly of, I, I I do think that the editors are doing their best. I, I I don't I think that I don't again I'm trying I'm also trying not to burn bridges here. You know, and I wasn't. <laughs> no, you know, I, no, I know you were. I know you were. I know you were. I know you were. I but I'm being honest. I mean, I, I do think that. Yeah, there's a couple of generations that have been skipped in terms of institutional knowledge about basically here's basic craft. Yeah. And luckily brevoort is still around and kicking and as long as brevoort is al alive and kicking then that exists somewhere so that's good yeah yeah i just uh you know i i i, I worry sometimes i worry i worry a lot about comics and and i particularly worry about marvel and dc because i just feel like they've lost the right sense of how to make comics you know i i look at i look at like the book publishers seem like they're doing a much better job of publishing comics to me these days like in terms of individual story structure and individual making sure that books are individually crafted, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it's a weird place to be in, you know, it is. And it's, it's a, it's a tough craft. I mean, I, it is a very singular set of skills that it takes to, to edit monthly comics and do it well. And it's, I think everybody who I'm working with who's doing it is doing a good job and is doing as good as they can. Are they all Tom Brevoort? No, you know, and I wish they were, but they, and I, I think they do too. Yeah. Knowing what you know, seeing what you've seen, what do you think the future of periodical comics is? I, I hesitate to say this because we've been saying it since 1972, but I just, I don't know that there's much of a future to it. Mm. Um, especially, I, especially, I mean, look at what we've been through for the last eight months yeah. and, and how, what a hit it's taken and it's still sort of struggling to get back on its feet. It's certainly at Marvel or DC. I went through this morning. I told you we get the PDFs of all the Marvel comics ahead of time and I keep them all in a giant folder. 
and I delete them, you know, as the as I get the actual physical comics. And I realized I get like 150 Marvel comic PDFs in my in this folder for some of them from March. So I had to go through this morning and figure out which ones had actually been printed and which ones were still outstanding and still a right. whole ton of them, yeah. uh, like a hundred Marvel comics in the, in the pipeline. And that doesn't augur well because a lot of them are from, you know, six, eight months ago. I got issues of empire tie-ins that were ready to go to press that were never printed. Sure. Because, and, they're, and they're being rebranded as King and black tie-ins. Yeah. You know? they're, yeah. They're like going in and changing four words or something, you know? It, and yeah, it's, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to sink any time. I don't think it's going to go away and sink, but I just, I don't, there, I don't think there's a f giant future in it. I'm not, I'm not betting on it at humanoids. I mean, it's the publisher yeah. of humanoids. I'm, you know, I like doing maybe one periodical just to sort of make sure we keep our hand in that business and, you know, stay in the diamond catalog and just keep a sense of market awareness. But I have no interest in doing a line of periodical comics out of humanoids. We're just, let's go OGN because that just makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but the math on it, how mm -hmm. I, it, the math on an OGN looks so much harder to me. It is crippling. It is crippling. Yeah. It is, it is so insanely difficult to make, money on an original graphic novel because printing will kill you. Yeah. I don't care if you're getting it printed in Saskatchewan or Taiwan or the moon, it's still going to be a gigantic chunk of that. And then, you, uh, you know, uh, uh, of your outlay. And so the profits margin, the profit margin is thin as it is. And then worse and worse every year, you're giving up more and more to Amazon. You know, yeah. you're giving because Amazon yeah. takes the biggest bite of of any retailer to a yep. publisher, and if you're given, you know, sixty five percent to to you know pulling a figure kind of out of the air, but not really, yeah. you know, to Amazon that leaves you nothing, and so it is. We got a lot of really good stuff in the pipeline, but we have had to work very hard at getting it on its feet because there's just not the money to 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 for anybody to suddenly turn around and go okay uh i'm gonna pay you what you get paid doing batman to write a hundred uh, 200 page graphic novel that right. we won't be able to see a profit on for two years or three years if ever if, if ever. ever yep it's it's hard this is i don't know i i this is a problem we struggle with all the time and uh yet reina telgemeier made it work sure but so it's, I, I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's great to base, <laughs> to base your economy on no. the best that someone did. I know. You know? I know. Like, no, 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 not. You know? I know. But this That's gets my, but this, gets, right. Too, but know? this gets to my, but it gets to my optimism that it can be done. Sure. No, of course. Of course so, it can be done. Yeah. I just, uh, I just, wor you know, one of the things I consistently worry about is that, is that we've got like what, four or five different schools that are teaching comics like that's what they teach so yeah. we're graduating 60 to 80 new cartoonists every single year yeah and these guys are told okay do a 200 page book and like like it and most of them are not gonna earn out no. their advance no it's just not the math doesn't You're work it's and, and, not gonna yes this is, you know, at, at humanoids, we're playing with really thin margins. We, because we're, you know, publishing comics in a time of COVID and it is, it is crushing to me to have to get on the horn with a younger creator, an up and comer and go, this is awesome work and it's very publishable. And this is the best I can do in his advance. And I'm not, it's not because I'm trying to lowball you and it's not because I'm trying to cheat you. It's literally, I can show you the math. Yeah, and this is the way it works, and and the deflation that comes with that to know that yeah, you could probably work at Walmart and make a little bit more money than this. Yeah. You know, it's tough. Uh, and I am, again, I so lucky to be where I am as a writer and as a somebody you can plug into administrative as well because there's there's room for me apparently, but I don't know how you'd start now and. Yeah make $20,000 a year if you're lucky doing comics. That's, 
I don't know. Yeah. Half yeah, no, I it, it it concerns me. I mean, it genuinely yeah. concerns. It's weird though because comics are better than they've been in years. When you look at these young artists creating, yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing books that are like, wow. And then I think, and they made eight dollars an hour I know, doing I know, it. I know, I know. And, and and it's not a thing that we talk about because we talk about Reina and we talk yeah. about Dave Pilkey and we talk about the people who, and Neil Gaiman and people who are successes. And oh, they made a whole lot of money from this. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't talk about the times where you don't make any money and right. you lose a whole lot of money trying to make comics. And it happens, I think, more than we talk about as a yeah. as a as a society, which you know, I don't know is healthy necessarily. Um, anyway, we've got another question, so let me get off that tangent. Okay. Sh show me what we got, Jordan. Uh, Jason Kelly, I've enjoyed a lot of your stuff. Fantastic Four, Kingdom Come, Flash, Daredevil, Empire, Ear Dimmel, all great. Do you have a piece of writing that you are especially proud of that may not have achieved the public acclaim slash notoriety? That is a, the last part of that question is the really interesting part. What have I done that I wish more people had seen? I'm looking at my bookshelf to see if there's any cues there. Um, would you count Archie? Do you think Archie counts as that or is people know sure. too, or do no, people know about Archie? Archie? Certainly. No, I think that's fair. Then Archie would be then Archie would be my answer. I mean, I I so dug writing in those characters, and I so enjoyed being in a in that rare place in comics that doesn't really exist except there, where you can write comedy and drama at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's talk about Archie. Do you? Uh, well, I mean, commercially, it seems like it hasn't really been sustainable. Did you think it would be sustainable to to adultify those characters? I mean, I I. You know, yeah. the, the classic formula worked really well for a really long time. And, right. and you, you know, you and Fiona was certainly, that was a big uh, a, a boost for the character. But the success of creative teams, it seems like it has done worse and worse and worse, it looks like to me. It does seem like that. And that's not necessarily a knock on who's followed, but it is. Absolutely. Yeah. It, I I don't, I mean, I didn't go into it wondering if this would be sustainable. I'm just wondering going into this going, I, I think this is a really interesting idea. Right. Um, because you know, if you're looking for somebody who's able to juggle the integrity of the characters with some sort of new point of view, you came to the right guy. Um, if I may say so, um, you may, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I have no, I have no good answer for you. Okay. I just that would, but that my answer, my answer to that, but the question, the answer is, I I wish more people knew about the Archie stuff because it's some of the best stuff I've ever written. Okay. Yeah. I was just, you know, you you wear so many hats that I I sometimes think that you think about things more fourth dimensionally than you probably do. Do you, do you know what I mean? Maybe. Maybe yeah. I get I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's that, part that of might my, be a bad assumption, and that's you know. Uh, that's that's part of my goal, dude. I mean, I seriously, yeah. that's the reason I wanted to own a comic store is because the only thing right. I hadn't done yet. Right. I've done ever. I've done everything but put the staples in the in the comics. I've done yeah. everything. So yeah. in my head, somewhere in here is the grand unified field theory yeah. of comics, yeah. and I just haven't had the six months to just go and yeah. sit in the corner and figure it all out. But it's all in here somewhere. Yeah. So, so was the owning the comic book store, the dumbest idea you've, you've ever had in your life? It was, it was the most expensive idea I've ever had in my entire <laughs> life. I could, it, it just, you could just set fire to your money yeah. and just cut straight to the chase. Sure. It, it, I knew it was not a profit center. I was prepared for how much of a hit it would take, I just wanted it to sort of sustain. And, but there were issues. I mean, there were going in, there were issues. We were in the, the guy we were in business with for the first year embezzled. So really didn't help, yeah. you know, puts us off in a bad place. It's a, yeah. that's a whole nother story for another time, but oh my God, we were, you know, it was, that was dark and we never, I don't think we ever really recovered from that, but also you're in a small college town, Muncie, Indiana. Yeah where there's already one comic store. Yeah. It was, it really was, you know, the guy had a comic store. We liked the guy. We liked the comic book store. He was going to go out of business. I didn't want him to go out of business because I liked the store and I didn't like the other store. So I want the store to exist. Yeah. And, and maybe I can learn something. I mean, yeah. I can learn the part that I hadn't learned before. It was the thing that 
was my biggest takeaway is as a creator, it was a reminder that I am competing every week with, with my work. I'm competing with so much more than every, I am thinking you're competing, about. You're competing with the whole history of comics at this point. At this point, yes. You're, 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 because of, because of comicsology, you're competing with everything Neil Gaiman has ever written. Yeah. You're competing with everything Jim Lee has ever drawn. You're competing with everything. And that came in a very sharp focus when I was, when I was getting, you know, pallets of really crappy Marvel comics, you know, to put on the shelves and go just, but there's just so much noise. The signal to noise ratio is so ginormous that it's a miracle sometimes that any of this stuff makes any registers at all. Right. And then you begin to understand why the retailers order defensively yes. yeah. to sell out. You know, yeah. like when you're on the other side of it, you think, oh, those retailers, they're holding us back. They're fucking it up. But no, they're making sure they don't go out of business. You yeah. know, um, yeah. now I think that a lot of my peers really have put way too much effort in the superhero part of their businesses and not enough on the other parts, you yeah. know, and they've kind of made their own beds sort of, but it, it, it's really complicated. And, and I think that, uh, you know, to answer the question that I posed to you earlier, I'm very worried about the future of periodical comics because periodical comics are so inextricably tied to Marvel and DC comics. Mm -hmm. And yep. Marvel and DC are in really dangerous places right now. Yep. Uh, you know, I think that I have heard, certainly, and I, you know, I, you never know if you can trust them, but I, I think they're telling me the truth that, uh, you know, uh, Ross has told me that Boom is up after COVID. Stevenson is telling me that Image is up during COVID. Yep. Uh, Vault is up during COVID. So these publishers that have embraced um, doing returnability, mm -hmm. um, doing creator own books, they're seeing actual success during this time where it looks to me, though we can't really tell because there's no sales charts at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but it looks to me like Marvel and DC are actually really suffering at this yeah. time. It would certainly um, seem to. Yeah, we, we don't, like you said, we don't know because we don't know the inner workings, but we would yeah. make an educated guess that they are yeah. suffering. Um, yeah. Again, if you just look at the number of books they've put money into that they're not publishing, yeah, that that's a huge, a huge hit. Yeah, I look at you know so and uh, so I'm with you. There's there. I understand why these. I, I do think the returnability is huge. I do think that that helps you as the retailer take the the leap of faith you need. Yeah, we need you to make. Yeah. Um, and certainly we're pushing for all of that with humanoids as well to go. Yeah. We've been, I've been pushing for returnable for a long time, but like I said about when we started this conversation about six hours ago, yeah. when I said it's harder to get from diamond than you think. Uh, but I, th I'm with you. I, I, I do want us to change the subject only because I don't want to end on this yeah. note because it's so dark, but yeah. I worry as do you about yeah. the future of of periodical comics? No, very good. I have I have positive questions to, to end this with. Though I we have a we have at least one more viewer question, which is oh, Pedrigo, Finally, I was wondering where he was going to. He asked the greatest question every week. Um, are there important differences between modern superheroes and ancient myth in terms of the roles that they play in our lives? That's a really thoughtful question. That's a very thoughtful question. Um, there is one fundamental difference, and that is the, and that is why I, I wince sometimes when people talk about superheroes being American, being modern myths. Myths have an end. Mm -hmm. Myth, mythic stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, Robin Hood shoots the arrow into the into the arrow. You know, the uh, King Arthur loses the sword. It's 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 all, and superheroes by nature, the way we've set them up, don't have that beginning, a middle, and end. They they're always in the middle. So. I, I think that the satisfaction you get out of a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and the meaning that a story, the meaning, the meaning that a story with an end has, is going to be different than the meaning of a story that really has no end, if yeah. you will. And so I think I think that that may be my answer to his question. Um, but there are certainly similarities. I mean, certainly the you know the. the it, more in Marvel. I mean, it's, you know, it's funny too. People talk about the DC characters being gods and the Marvel characters being less so, but I got to tell you, uh, the stories, of the gods are full of hubris mm. are full of the gods screwing up and doing stuff, dumb stuff. Um, and DC characters aren't built that way, but Marvel characters, almost every meaningful Marvel character 
was born out of a combination of uh, arrogance mm -hmm. and uh, and um, and and circumstance. I mean, arrogance. I mean, think about it. You know, Reed Richards goes up on the ship because he thinks he can protect them from cosmic rays. Iron Man is out there, you know, doing his thing. Spider Man thinks he's bigger than everybody else. Every that 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 sense of arrogance is really an important part of what makes a Marvel character a Marvel character. And that actually seems to be more to me that uh, that reminds me of of myth more than Superman or Batman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Uh, we have another one, Jordan, because the sign's still up. Oh, you take the sign down then. Jeez. Um, <laughs> I'm like trying to follow my cues. God. Um, oh, there is one. Okay. Here okay. We go. Uh, Stefan Blitz. Or Stefan Blitz. Ah, right. Stefan. Love uh, Stefan. Uh, what writers have had the biggest influence on your work and point of view? Outside maybe even including Maybe even including comics, non-comics writers. I, no, I should say, if, if you're going outside comics, Harlan Ellison was, mm -hmm. was the guy who taught me how to be a writer. Yeah. Um, and taught me that it's about emotion. And taught me that it's about heart. And it's not about mechanics. And it's not about, you know, plot intricacy. Mm -hmm. um, and then within comics... Uh, the ones who were the greatest influences me were the the second generation Marvel writers, not Roy and Stan, but Steve Gerber, yeah. Steve Englehart, Jim Starlin, uh, the the first generation of Marvel writers who came along and w did not try to write like Stan, and had their own voice. And there was a quirkiness to that, and there was an experimental nature to that that way of telling stories. Uh, that they were just you know twenty two year old kids just trying whatever they could try, and because it was just cheap comics nobody really cared nobody was looking over their shoulders and they were just doing howard the duck and whatever uh, and getting away with murder and trying stuff and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work but boy those guys inform me every time i sit down at the keyboard yeah do you do you think that we can have generation work like that you know or yeah, I don't know, like the studio guys or or like these 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 movements that happen in comics that just feel like they can't ever happen again because because of we the way we balkanized things or maybe maybe I'm too depressed on that. I don't know. You may be too depressed on that. I think that and again, I, I could be wrong, but I was thinking about this earlier today because I was reading a bunch of uh, DCs, a bunch of new DCs that came out today. And there are a lot of young writers very young writers doing some interesting stuff there that's not it's not amazing and I, I didn't read anything today that was going to win an eisner award right but there were and i wish i could remember names but if i if i start doing that i'll go down that rabbit hole i can't do that but let's just it's it names that i'm not familiar with that i know are younger creators younger writers who are not white males sure I think that's that's your answer i think that yeah. that's your next that's your your next quantum leap forward. Your next Denny O'Neill is not going to be a, a college white kid. Your next Denny O'Neill is going to be, you know, Ava Ewing uh, yeah. or, 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 you know, Teeny Howard or something like that. It's going to be somebody who doesn't look like you and me. Yeah. And I, of all the things that have changed in comics in my entire tenure, the thing that has been the most gratifying and the thing that has changed the most i mean is the fact that comics are are a, done by a lot greater you know a diverse uh, number of creators there is so much more room to go i mean we got so okay. many we got so much more room to go but yep. but that you know those 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 voices weren't being heard yeah 10 10 20 years ago even 10 years ago yeah so yeah. i think that's I that's think yeah I Go think ahead. one of the fantastic things about comics is that really all you need is a pen and a paper and some time, you know, yeah. and it's not, you know, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to max out your credit card. No, comics, you know, no. especially, and again, let's get back to digital for a second. I mean, the beauty of the beauty of digital, the beauty of the, the internet is it's democratized comics, right? Do you want to be in comics? Great. You're in comics. Go put the sweat equity in. And so what I tell people when they talk about well, how do I break into comics? How do you break into comics? You do a digital comic and you get okay. in and you, and you put it on a website and you do it on a regular basis and you, you get it out there and, 
and you learn by doing that way. And all you're losing is sweat equity because you're not having to print the thing there. You, so you're not, like you said, you're not busting your credit card. Sure. And the advantage of doing your web comic as, you know, a way of breaking in is that if you're doing it and you're putting your work up on a regular basis, like whether that's once a day or once a week or whatever, but if you're doing it for a you know, big run of time, you got to leg up on everybody else because an editor will look at that and go, not only do I like the work, but I can see this person has a work ethic. Yeah. And that is, is you know, I'm not going to hire the person and they're going to completely flick out on me. So uh, that's where we're looking. That's where we're looking for talent. Now we're looking at printed stuff, but we're also looking online. So, but, oh, I mean, so isn't this uh, kind of effectively saying, uh, hey, kid, go work for free for a while? Uh, and maybe if you're lucky, we'll, we'll give you a hand up. I, I, you know, and I'm not, that's not an indictment yeah. of, of anything that you're doing. I just, this doesn't seem like what we want. But that's this. how, but that's how fiction works, right? Doesn't I mean, that's how short, that's how short stories work. Right, right. That's how you, you just, I just write until comics, you sell something. I, you know, cause comics were different for a really long time. Yeah. But, had, if you're, but, but if you're doing, to, right. But if you're doing your own comic, right. Yeah then it's no different than me doing my own short story. Right. That's all. So I get what you're saying. Uh, and I'm protective of younger creators and not wanting them to be taken advantage of. But yeah. again, there's nothing wrong with you going out there and just continuing to do your audition piece until you get hired. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess I, I just worry about the notion of, uh, sort of instilling a work for free ethic in people when they're at the cusp of their career, do you know? And, and it may be not being clear what the, uh, what the payoff could be other well, than making comics, which, you know, I, sure is a legitimate thing in and of itself, but, you know, speaking as a guy in a store full of books and this is sure. what I want to be doing for the rest of my life. I need people to be able to make money off comics. Sure. Right? And it's not, I don't, it's not just me making money off comics, right? right. Or, or the publishers, especially. Right. Uh, yeah. No, you I, need to create a people to, I, so they can keep doing it. Yes. All make money. Cause if they but, don't, then I knock but, over all the books. But, uh, but, you're, but you're not, but you're not working for free. If you're doing your own comics that you right. own and putting them online. Yeah. That's not, that to me is not the same as, as working for free as, as having, you know, who said that idiot who has young blood now that, that mm, Andrew, yeah. Andrew, Andrew Rev, that guy, you know, getting people trying to con people into working for free because right. they are going to make you a big star. Well, no, that's bullshit. You know, that's, that's, I will, I will physically fight you over that, but yeah. 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 Okay. No, I mean, I accept that as an answer and I, I agree with it really too. I just, you know, I get, I get frustrated for the kids sometimes. I really do. I'm like, I, I want them to be able to make money off this. You've got to be able to make money off your art. That's yeah. the, you know, that's, that's, that's the goal. You know, yep. I, uh, I always believed in the Dave Sim model of owning what you do and just doing it and then making money off it for the rest of your fucking life. Now yeah. that didn't work out too well in the end for Dave, but, uh, <laughs> but for uh, a while know, it worked out really well, it worked out really well, man. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, so what would be your advice to, to uh, an upcoming creator, someone, you know, other than just make comics and put them online. So if someone's a writer, right? If you're, if right. you're someone's a writer who wants to write comics, you, you need an artist to do that. Right. So in that case, you know, there's, there's websites, there's places online to find artists or, you know, it used to be, you could go up and down the artist alley at conventions. That's off the table for now, but you know, finding an artist that way. But if you're, but in, and I wish I had better advice about that. And you reminded me that I really need to go find specifically sites that I can recommend that I will you know, put up because I know they exist. Uh, and I always forget what they are when you, when you put this in front of me. Uh, so that's one piece of advice. But the, I mean, the other piece of advice is just write stuff you care about. Write stuff that you care. Don't write what you think people want to read. Write what you want to write. Write what you are passionate about because people can tell when you're writing for an audience rather than writing for, you know, to express something in yourself. It just shows there's a, I can figure out how to tell the story without naming names. So, um, I was at DC as an editor and I was working on a book and it was objectively not a good book. 
it was just objectively not, and there was nothing I could do about it. It was just like, it was baked into the, you know, but I enjoyed it. And I went to Dick once. I said, I said, why is, I mean, I know objectively this is not a good comic book, but I still enjoy reading it every month. He said, because the writer would write it for free and it shows. Yeah. And he was absolutely right that that's, and I'm not recommending you should write for free. I'm just saying it should read like, it read like this person really wants to write this story. Yeah. And has yeah. something to say. That's, that is, that you cannot fake that. And so, that is so, so that, passion trumps uh, uh, craft skill. Passion, uh, actually, uh, yes. I mean, yeah. it's. I mean, passion. It, you can have craft and you can have skill, but if you don't have passion, then it's just you may as well be doing Sudoku puzzles. You know, yeah. you may as well yeah. be doing crossword puzzles. It's yeah. people don't. Craft is awesome. Craft is a necessary evil, but man, if. I use James Bond movies as an example too, and I'm talking to young writers. I said, "Look, um, plot and craft, and you know the the the, the dotting of the eyes and the crossing of the T's, all that's really important. But no one remembers the plot of a James Bond movie. Yeah, no one. You just what you remember are the car chases. You remember the sex scenes. You remember the big fights. You remember the moments when your blood was up and you were emotionally connected. That's what you remember. Yeah. And so, as a writer." Never, ever forget that you're writing about emotion. Plot is just a structure to yeah. hang your hang emotion on. Yeah. It's people remember moments. The moment of Spider-Man lifting the big giant machine off his back, right? The Ditko moment. Mm -hmm. you, you know the scene. Everybody knows that Absolutely. scene who reads comics. I challenge anybody watching this to tell me the plot of that comic. He had to get uh, the, he had to bring the drugs to her, right? Uh, what was the, it was, but there was more to it. Like, what was the? You know, most people won't even remember. It was it was Doctor Octopus, but most people won't even remember that. Yeah. It was just what what? How did yeah. he get there? And had and what did he do next? Nobody remembers that. Yeah. It's the moment when your blood is up. That's what you remember. So it's if you craft is important. It's you know skill is you know is is something you can learn. Craft is something you can learn, but passion is not something you can learn. Yeah. If it's not there, then then you are an empty shell. How does it how does it change um, writing those moments, uh, writing those blood up moments mm -hmm. between a twenty ish page story uh, and and a two hundred page story? I've never thought about it before. I have no answer to that question whatsoever. It's just okay. it somehow fit. It somehow fits in that envelope however big or small that it is okay do you um uh when you're writing something bigger are you are you trying to get those moments every so often i mean like how do you approach it uh from a structural point of view i guess i don't it's not so much that i'm looking to get it in on a like any slotted in on a certain you know every 20 pages this is something emotional has got to happen it's just more that I'm more conscious, uh, the bigger a canvas I'm working on, the more conscious I am of the real estate that isn't doing me any good. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, don't, don't waste that space. Don't, it, it, if there's a, if, if you can put emotion there, put emotion there. Um, I think it was John Ford who said that a great movie is three good scenes and no bad scenes. Mm. And mm. that is, there's something to that quote. So, mm -hmm. It's, it's not so much that I worry about putting in, it's not so much that I worry about putting in the emotional beats and the big emotional moments as I, I work on taking out the other ones. Interesting. And so, and I guess this becomes the second part of my question that when you're working on a bigger canvas where you've got 180 pages or whatever, hmm. it seems like it would be structurally harder to, to, cause I agree that, that comics are about reduction Mm -hmm. about finding the simplest way to communicate yep. an idea yep. between two panels and letting the audience draw their conclusion between those things, you yep. know? Um, uh, so if comics are an act of reduction, then, then doesn't a bigger canvas work against you somehow? It just dictates, okay. the, it dictates the kind of story you have to tell. Okay. It just dictates the kind, the kind of story you have to tell and the, the density of which you can tell it and the scope of your story. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I grant your point, but yeah, it's also more difficult for me. I, I hate working on a 180 page canvas because 
I don't hate it, but I, but it's very daunting to me because I'm so used to working on a 20 page canvas Yeah, that yeah. when you open it up to me and make it 10 times as large, I'm working on something now that's sizable Yeah, and I can't talk about it, but I'm working on something sizable and it's freaking me out because I don't, you know, it's such a big expansive canvas. So yeah. all the ways I know to pace things, all the instinctive ways I pace comics and stuff that, that goes out the window. So it's a different kind of skill, but it's, I don't know. How much or, or at all are you doing hands-on editing as editor in chief? Some, uh, Rob Levin, who works under me as the editor, he's brilliant. I mean, I get like that guy, you just, if I talk to him once a week, it's a, miracle because he just over he's the machine doing his editorial stuff and he's yeah. doing great but i still look at stuff i still do hands-on editing um i don't love it because it's it's very time intensive and there's always other stuff going on when you're a publisher but Brevor, tom Brevor and i talk about this that, that when i do editing at this point and I'm using his phrasing, but we have the same methodology, which I, the, when I look at a script at this point, all I'm editing it for is, is it drawable? Mm. Does it make basic sense? I'm not going to go in at this point at, and, and correct language and, and fix typos at this point. At this point, I'm just going to, all I want to know is, does it hang together, make sense? And can an artist draw it? Yeah. If that's the case, then great. Then that's presuming I've hired somebody who I know is good. That's, you know, sure. um, and then just let it go. And then you, and then I find, I do more editing on the actual, I say boards, but they're not boards anymore, but I get pages on the, on the actual finished pages. Yeah. It's much easier for me to edit. Yeah. Once I've got a, a, a lettered page in front of me, it's not fair to letters. Sure. But sure. I, I'm, I'm fighting to make sure they get some sort of combat pay yeah. for having to do that. Um, yeah. But it's, so I, I guess, but let me connect that to the previous question about sure. uh, working on books of longer length, right? So, yeah. so trying to edit a 180 page book seems to me so much more difficult than, than editing a 20 page book. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no, it is, it is, but it, it is easier in one sense in that the, like you said, the, the reduction or the, the economy of storytelling is, yeah. is how I, I tend to put it. Uh, it's more crucial in a periodical than it is in a, in 180. And if you got 180 pages to play with in a bigger canvas, you have a little more wiggle room. So it's, you know, you don't have to, you're not as you're the craft of that conciseness is not super important. Mm. I mean, on a bigger canvas, you've got a little more elbow room. So it, so I don't, uh, it's not, I don't know. I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I, we've been talking for two and a half hours. I'm, I'm, my head, my head's fried at this point, but <laughs> it is, it, are all of your interviews two and a half hours? See, the, the thing about comics, right, is there's, there isn't an answer. There is no one answer to how you do comics or how it works or, no. you know, it, like it, I've interviewed, you're like a artist 150 now at this point and everybody gives me different answers and I love yeah. it. And it's what, yeah what makes comics great because yeah. because if you start talking about about prose you start talking about film like there's conventions that people get into and there's narrow mm -hmm. boxes that that those exist to a much lower degree in comics that i can yep. see i absolutely which is one of the appeals of comics yeah yeah but you're right we have been talking for two and a half hours and that's really preposterous and uh so let's start to wrap this up uh with the what do you want to plug what do you got uh, either from humanoids, from yourself, uh, what do you feel like you'd like to talk about uh, for the future? Humanoids, we got some really cool stuff coming out. I mean, again, that's we were able to take advantage of the COVID situation in, in the sense that we didn't have to do a pencils down order. We didn't have to put anybody on furlough. Instead, yeah. we had the we had enough in the bank where we could step back for a few months and just go, okay, we're going to push our whole slate forward six months and really think about what I want this outfit to look like now that I'm the publisher, what do I want to publish? Yeah. And so we've got a, we've got a bunch of really cool stuff coming up. We've got uh, a book called MPLS sound, uh, that's drawn by Meredith Laxton done by uh, Hannibal taboo. And, um, and, uh, he's going to be really upset. Joe Illich. Mm. Um, that's, uh, about, about the Minneapolis music scene. Yeah. 
uh, in, you know, in Prince's early days. Uh, and it's a really good OGN. Um, we got, I, there's other stuff that we've got, I can't really talk about, but I, we got a book called space bastards actually that's coming out. This is back to the period. I said that we wanted to be in the periodical business a little bit. Um, we found this awesome, awesome Lobo esque, which is not my personal style, but I recognize a good comic when I see it, sort of a Derek Robertson drawn uh, book by two relative newcomers. Uh, and it's, it's, if you like Lobo, if you like Bisley, if you like that sort of sensibility, Space Bastards is your comic. And that is something that we're, that's coming out in January from Humanoids. And that I know we're really proud of. Um, it's really funny. Uh, myself, yeah, I'm just I'm kind of between things and I've got stuff I'm working on, but I can't really talk about. Okay. And I'm, it's, it, it's been a weird last six months. This is, there was a point in maybe April where it was the first month in 30 something years where there wasn't a comic book out there with my name on it that month. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it really, that was a real scary time. Uh, so there's still, you know, little stuff I'm finishing up. The last issue of the Neil Adams Fantastic Four book is due to drop any time. There's a, I did one of those Marvel snapshots books with, uh, Kurt Busiek and, and, uh, you know, the, those that he's doing the Marvel, Marvel spinoff books. Um, but other than that, I'm just trying to figure out what the next act looks like for me as a, as a writer, doing more creator owned stuff, doing more stuff through humanoids, doing more OGN stuff that I can't do anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, do you, do, uh, when you do that work, do you think it, it is going to be through humanoids? Is that? Probably. I think this, I think at that point, I think that the stuff that I want to tell, I have a couple of stories that I want to tell that are very small personal stories um semi one's one's autobiographical one's not and i think that's the place for them i think that before i can I, I say this completely honestly because this is true before i got to humanoids they were doing a, a, a sub line called life drawn right uh which is books like louisa now and then which i think uh, did you read louisa now and then i did yeah it was quite good yeah it was the it's the best thing i read that entire year. Yeah. Uh, and that was before I got to humanoids. I mean, I'm not pimping it because I'm the publisher. That was a good book. Yeah. And so that's a good company to be in that life. The life drawn is the, the more personal, you know, smaller stories, some biographical autobiographical sometimes, but that's, that's the line. And that's something I want to play around with. Cause that's a, that's a form I have not used yet. So let's, let's stretch another muzzle. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, humanoids sort of traditionally was publishing basically nothing but European comics. Right. Um, you're doing original work now there. Mm -hmm. What is, is it going to be the majority of the line? Is it, is it 50, 50? Like how, what's, what's that going to look like over the next it'll, year? It'll be the majority of the line. We'll sure. always still do the occasional European project over here. And, but you just kind of, you, you know, you have to pick them right because the, the Rosetta stone of the work that is equally popular in Europe and here is a very rare bird you know whatever that whatever that thing is and it's not happening very often so it's mobius um, pretty much is it's it's exactly it's mobius that's it is it you know we call specifically uh um, it's ink call and other than that what is it is it ain't asterisk and obelix you know yeah, it yeah. ain't 10 10 and it ought to be but it ain't i actually gotta say just you know like since since i'm talking to you i think it was a crazy bad mistake that you guys made putting ink call in paperback uh really fantastically as a $50 hardcover mm -hmm. and it's not going to sell any better as a $24 uh, soft cover. Unfortunately, I, um, I don't, I, actually I, I quibble with that. Looking at the sales figures, I actually think that we got some, we got some out of that that I didn't think we were going to get. Okay. I, I, yeah, I just think that two years from now, it's going to look like, Oh, we left money on the table by downgrading the format. For what I, that's worth, you know. That's, no, it's fair, and this, and again, I like, I like that we're having this conversation in front of all these other people because it's a very good illustration of the kind of shit I got to worry about every day. <laughs> that sounds like a great place to leave this. Actually, there you go. Well, it's been a joy. It's been, a, it's been a lot. I again. I, it's no surprise to anybody who knows me that I could talk for two and a half hours without stopping, but it's been and, fun. And I feel like you and I could keep talking for another two and a half hours sure we could, and, and we wouldn't even blink. No, yeah. no. Well, we will, we'll do this again at some point. You will find, you know, you'll, you'll 
cycle me back into your your novel probably you know yeah, a year and a half from now, two years from now. That's going to be true because you've written a lot of things. Sure. Um, I really want to thank you for your time, Mark. I want to thank. Your audio just dropped out and you just froze up. And I cannot, oh, nope. wait. Still talking, there we go, okay. We did there you are, okay. All right, um, but I wanna thank you for this for this book uh, and, and Alex as well. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get through to him to get him to be part of this too. Um, this is just, it's a really special book and it's, and it's a book that really gives us a lot of feelings about hope and about what these characters can be and what they should be and and just I I feel like we need these kind of models in our lives and I'm just so glad that that I I'm that you were able to make this book and that I'm able to sell it and I it makes me happy things like this make me happy it and is my doesn't pleasure have hero comics very often anymore so uh I I really I really appreciate it well, anytime, sir. Yeah, yeah. Next month, our uh, our book is our book is Understanding Comics, uh, and I'm going to be talking to Scott McCloud about Understanding Comics. Um, this is this is a great book, and you're going to love this too. And it's also going to be a really great conversation about comics and craft. And I think we're going to talk about some of the things that Mark and I talked about here in terms of uh, uh, you know what happened with digital comics and all the promise that that it it, it showed and then never happened and. Maybe we'll try to figure some of this stuff out. It probably won't. I don't know. Uh, and then later in the month, um, we have for our Adult Graphic Novel of the Month Club, uh, the new book uh, category. This is Sacrifice of Darkness um, by Roxanne Gay, Tracy Lynn Oliver, uh, and Rebecca Kirby. Um, they are going to be here to talk to us about this uh, in about two weeks, give or take. Um, and then uh, just a couple days after that, we will be talking to um, uh, Jonathan Garnier and Johan Sacra, uh, who are French, um, and we'll be speaking with the translator, so this is always going to be a fun thing. This is the kids' selection for the month, Timo the Adventurer, which is just a beautiful and lots of fun book. This is really a, just a gorgeous book. Um, so great, great comics and great conversation about comics, and that's what we're trying to bring you. I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, and being part of this, uh, everybody who's watching at home, I want to thank Jordan. Uh, I want to thank Kat, who's been minding the store uh, uh, and keeping the store running. And I want to thank Mark Wade for participating. And I want to thank our sponsors at The Beat. And thank you all. We'll talk to you next time.